now. Hey, everybody, Monday again, and this week, my guest is my very good friend, John Paterno. Hey, John. Hello, Mr. Sheps. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I am excellent. Um, I would like to point out that uh, John and I have known each other for over 30 years, mm -hmm. but we will attempt to refrain from uh, too many inside jokes. I don't think there'll be that much of that. So nope. thank you very much. And before we get started, though, I need to do a little bit of a uh, little bit of housekeeping for all the folks listening. So um, John is our second to last guest of the year because I've decided that 50 weeks in a row is enough. And I'm going to take some time off. So basically going to take December off. Um, next week is the Q&A with Steve Lillywhite, which means we need your questions in advance. So if you go to the I was going to read the URL, but it's really long. Go to the Pure Mix page for uh, Andrew Talks to Awesome People or just Google it and go to the Pure Mix page and there's a place to submit questions. So please submit your questions beforehand. Otherwise, it's going to be a very short chat with Mr. Lillywhite, which is silly because he's crazy and fun. So we should keep him going until he gets loopy from being tired. Um, and then uh, we're taking all of December off. And as of right now, January 11th is our first show back with... Uh, Eric Valentine, we might come back a week earlier, but I kind of doubt it because I plan on being drunk enough that I'll still be hung over on the 4th. That's that. Hi, John. Hello, Andrew. Thanks for sitting through that. It's always, I never know whether to do that with people on screen or off screen because... You know. It's totally fine. I, you know, it's it's great to hear what's coming up and, and what to look forward to. And, and you've got a very radio friendly voice. Well, it's I mean, an SM7. You know, there's shades of Howard Stern here. Well, mm -hmm. now I've heard that before. Me on mm -hmm. a microphone, there is some like if I say take your top off, uh -huh. it's Howard Stern. It's that Long Island thing. <laughs> it's the Long it's Island totally... thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He that, he's, <laughs> he can be funny, but I don't know if it's a good thing to sound like him. Yeah, there's there's just there's shades of it. I wouldn't, you know. All right, all right. Okay. So look, I want to start slightly before we actually met. All right. Because one of the things I always enjoy finding out is how people even find out that doing what we do is a thing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there are a few people who've come from legacies of it or musician parents. So they were in the studio young. But most of the people we've talked to, that's not the case. So you have been on the East Coast from when you were born, but you moved down to South Florida when you were, what, 11 or something? 12, yeah. 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. how, what were you doing? What were you into? What was going on? Well, I started playing guitar at like age eight. And so my dad had played guitar. My parents always had music around. I was the kid who would stick a pencil into a vinyl record and walk around the house asking for music to be played. <laughs> so I was like always into it. Um, first music I ever remember hearing was the Beatles and... And I think I was always fascinated with the energy part of it. The fact that that count off for I, I saw her standing there, you know, that every time you put it on, it kind of hits you the same way. So I think early on that was, I mean, I didn't know about obviously engineering or anything like that, but there was something about the fact that that record stored this kind of energy that I think always really stuck with me. Right. Yeah. And so, so you're playing in bands, I'm assuming, because everyone played in bands, right? Yeah, not in a lot. But but by the time I got to Florida, um, you know, that was like around 78. Van Halen had just kind of hit at that point, 78, 79. And then I just took this deep dive into, you know, into learning Van Halen and getting into all of this other stuff. Um, yeah, I played in a few bands through high school. Um, but so yeah. did you... Did you approach it more like you just wanted to learn to play this stuff, not you wanted to go out and play it for people or get chicks or like, I mean, everyone has different motivations for playing guitar, but not everybody is into it for the actual guitar playing. I, at the time I was into it for the actual playing. I, I remember just spending hours learning things, trying to learn things, learning tunes and just kind of being obsessed with, um, with music right I, and all by you really just uh yeah um because by the time i went to the university of miami i still don't know how i got in i was the definition of how do you get a guitar player to turn down you know this one right give him a chart you got yeah. it that was me i was the poster boy of that 
Well, so, so but so what is the bridge between playing guitar and then mm-hmm. deciding you wanted to go to the recording program because you didn't want to go as a as a music student. You wanted to go to record, right? Exactly. Yeah. So once I got out of high school, I was going to be an electrical engineer. That's what I was starting to study for. My my dad at some point um he didn't want me to be a musician. How weird. Um yeah, he <laughs> imagine that, right? <laughs> so um yeah, so I was I went to community college and then got a job at a music store and apprenticed with the uh, repair guy there who was named Tiny. So he's like six so he's foot huge. five. Yeah. Yep. We were in this itty bitty shop and I was biasing and fixing Marshall amps and fixing old PV power amps and things like that with him. And then I was taking classes, you know, to, to think about going to an EE school. And then I got a copy of Mix Magazine every summer, was it, that they had the, the school the education issue, things? yeah. Yeah. And so I read about the program at the University of Miami. And it was a major in music, or it was a music engineering program. So yes. I just figured that would work. And then I had then I found out, though, that you had to get into the school of music. Yeah, as a performance it, major, which was yeah. terrifying. Yes. And... Um, And at that point, I'd been doing a lot of live sound gigs for a contractor in the area. And a lot of the UM faculty were on these dates. So I knew, met a lot of these people outside of school, including the guy I had to audition for, this guy named Randall Dahlhan, who was the guitar teacher there, jazz guitar teacher. And I'd asked him for a teacher and he recommended a guy named Brian Monroney. Yeah. And I literally took a six month crash course in jazz and somehow got through the audition and that's how i made it into school so i was a rock guy who played jazz guitar to become a recording engineer right now Uh, i'm wondering do they still structure the program the same way where you have to be a performance major or is it its own thing now uh i believe it's still in the school of music um i don't know i'd have we'd have to ask but yeah yeah it's because it is an interesting thing because i mean the the brass faculty hated me like you're not here to do this we're all wasting our time so there would be like i mean with the usual thing like you slack off you slack off and then one semester you decide i'm really going to go for this Mm -hmm. and it was no better like i still sucked (laughs) and then i everybody's wondering what the hell is going on so it's an interesting thing to have to do and i think it's it is good because Mm -hmm. i think especially when we were going there it was people went there to make records they didn't learn to do post or game sound or any of that it was there to make records with -hmm. musicians and you can't overstate how important it is to at least understand music yeah while you're doing that but yeah it's a it's a very interesting dynamic to go into something where technically your major is something you should not be majoring in <laughs> so it's almost like the fallback position was built in. It's yeah. like you should be majoring in music, but you have this electronic stuff and you have to kind of get that together too, at least for us. But yeah, but I but I, that's the opposite kind of what you're saying, but okay. No. Yeah. And so right. was your was your dad happy with that decision or was it still Yeah, really... he was fine with it. Yeah. No, he was fine with it and and so that's what we did. You know, my dad worked hard. My dad was an airplane mechanic and, you know, and and he just wanted me to you know, that do something that that would be, you know, not climbing up and down on ladders and, you know, that kind of a thing. And it's also that time period, it was still very important if you could to have a four year college degree, like that was still just an existential thing Mm -hmm. that parents wanted for all of their children, if possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was the first one kind of in my family I think that that went to school or or one of the first anyway in you know my dad's side of the family and my mom's for that matter so um yeah it all worked out fine and you know I've spent three years at Miami and um and that's where we met originally I think my first year was your last year I I believe so 88 yeah it took me six years to get through college three and three so and I think you 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 were out in four right yeah. Yeah. I was there yeah. 84 to 88. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, yeah. but there were a lot mm-hmm. of people down there. There were, there were I mean, Joe Barisi, um, obviously, cause um, talked to him. He was week two of all this. Mm-hmm. So, um, but a huge group and people uh, on the tech side and more on the post side and, you know, yeah. Oscar winners and exactly. 
it's, yeah, a lot of the people, yeah, that there were what, there were at least 10 of us, I think, from our couple of year range that that made it out to LA and, and you know, did our things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems like schools go in waves like that, because the music school had had that wave sort of in the, the 10 years previous, when yeah. Jocko and Will Lee and Matheny and all those guys were at the school. I mean, still had amazing musicians there when we were there. Mm -hmm. But it, I don't think it was the same, like, they were all there at the same time kind of thing, which yeah. is kind of exactly. the feeling I get about our time at Miami. Yeah, yeah. Joe was my roommate for a semester. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the dorms. or at, in, in the dorms. A, yeah. In the, well, the student apartments that they had out in the back. But right. yeah. Right. But yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So you get that out of great. Miami and you're going to mm -hmm. go off into the world. I already mm -hmm. know this because I did the exact same thing. But so your choices were what coming out? Well, New York, Nashville, or or L.A. Um, I could have stayed in Miami, but I really didn't. I wasn't into doing Latin music. I didn't want to go to Nashville because I wasn't in the country. So that kind of left New York and L.A. And um, all my friends went to L.A. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I, I ventured out there. Joe had been out there a year and a half before me. Um, you know, there are a few other people I knew. And plus, I mean, L.A. is where Landau was and Lukather and all my favorite guitar players and, you know, a lot of my favorite musicians. So, right. so that's pretty much why I picked L.A. Well, Brian Monroney was also out there at that point, right? Brian Monroney was out there as well. Yep. He was yeah. playing with, I don't remember who he was playing with, but yeah, he was still totally doing his thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So out you went, and what'd mm -hmm. you do? <laughs> I, because I mean, it, it's hard to imagine now for mm -hmm. people sort of who are the age that we were then going to LA. There were hundreds of studios mm -hmm. that were all like viable places to go learn to make records. Not there are three or four good places, and then everybody else is just working out of their basement. Like exactly. hundreds of full on studios so yeah. did you have a plan heading out there or did you just know there are enough studios i know people i'm going you know i went out there spring of that year and with resumes i had an interview at the complex with a guy named art kelm did you ever meet art uh, yeah 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 and so i thought i was going to start as a tech and then kind of transition into working as a you know as an assistant or whatever, but it would get me out there. It was, it was a decent way to start. And I thought I had this job lined up. So I flew out in March, hung out with some friends, saw, got to see a little of LA, went back to Miami. And then two weeks later, I found out that everybody at the complex quit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my only, that was my only real job. And then, um, but while I was out there, I was, um, I went bowling with Joe and the studio manager of a place called Cornerstone. His name was Maddie Spindell, who now uh, just takes care of Rick Springfield. He's like his road manager and all this other stuff, half front of house guy. And, um, so, so I came back to, I came back to Miami complex went away. Um, then I got a call from Joe saying, uh, Maddie wants to know if you want a job. So and that was two weeks before I was planning on moving anyway. Kind of so, perfect. Yeah. So I hopped in the car, drove across the country and, and had a gig waiting for me. And so I started at Cornerstone and then they had a house studio called Preferred. And, and was this as, and a, as a tech or as an assistant? This was as an assistant. Right. Great. And, and they were like, you know, the do it do it all yourself facilities. So they were like one room places. So there's no, there's no runner studio managers there or not there. I mean, they're, you know, preferred was a house. And so, you know, it's just the homeowner was up in the house. And so that was it. it was, so I was responsible for everything, getting food and making sure the tape machines were aligned and knowing where everything was and all that other stuff. Um, it's funny, Joe, Chicor Joe Ciccarelli was one of the first guys I ever assisted. Really? Yeah, yeah. And that was at the house. And I remember him busting me for not aligning the low-frequency repro on the tape machine. And, <laughs> yeah, 
because it was only like the second time I'd ever aligned a tape machine at that point. And, right. I, you know, and, and I just remember him looking at me and just getting a little scowl and, and, but <laughs> off we went, you know, <laughs> wow. but, but it was, but you know, but he hired me a few years later to do a record with him. So it wasn't all that bad, but, um, but after I was there for about six weeks, the studio manager called me up and said, um, the guy you replaced, he, is coming back because he's being requested. So I don't have any work for you for six weeks. Ugh. So, um, so I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting, but thank God for, you know, the Miami connection and a few people came through with, you know, suggestions, recommendations. And, uh, Barisi was very instrumental in that. And our friend, mutual friend, Rich Tonus, he had recommended me a couple of sunset sound actually. Right. And I became this fill-in guy at all of these studios. So if it was a two-room facility, I was the third guy. If it was a one room, I was, so someone would get beat up and then I'd get a call and I'd come in and work for a few days. And I loved it. It yeah. was great. And it, it was right before all assistants were made freelance, which was a huge deal in LA, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, to this day, like it's sort of known capital is the only place where staff engineers are actually still on salary. But mm -hmm. it's been that way for 20 years because sort yeah. of overnight, one studio said, we're not keeping you on staff. And then everybody took people off staff. But you were freelance before assistants were freelance. I was, yeah, until Sunset Sound hired me. And then I was technically their employee for about a year. And then they fired me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so this is Sunset Sound as opposed to Sound Factory. So you had a, a year at Sunset? Well, at that time, Sound Factory was owned by Sunset Sound. Right. And so I think what happened was um, Rich had recommended me to the studio manager at Sunset because um, one of the guys who was a staff assistant got a DUI and he had to go pick up trash on the freeway for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so they needed somebody. Perfect. And, and Rich recommended, um, I think Rich recommended two of his friends, Joe Barisi and John Paterno. Now, Joe had been out in LA a year and a half before me. And I'd only been there like two months, maybe three. Right. And so I went in, I met Craig, the manager, and then I met the tech staff and everybody seemed like was signed off on me enough. So I got into the rooms and I ended up assisting there for like three weeks. And right toward the end of the stint, Craig pulls me aside and we're talking for a minute. And he goes, he goes, yeah, so you've been out here a year and a half. Where else have you worked? And I'm like, no, I've actually only been out here three months. And his face went like white. He's like, you know, it's like, but you don't have enough experience and all this <laughs> other stuff. And I was like, look, your techs are happy. Your clients are happy. What are you worried about? And, <laughs> you know, I, I had this streak of being able to do that and say that to people. For some reason, I, I had a, a certain, it's just confidence. I wouldn't call it arrogance, but I was like confident that everybody was happy. And I knew I was working hard. And, and, right. then, and then I'd done a few other fill-in gigs over the next few months. Like this probably happened in the fall of 1990. And by the summer of 91, I think they had, they had hired me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And did you almost, so Sunset Sound, very famous on Sunset Boulevard, three studios, mm -hmm. got the Doors records made there, a lot of Prince records made there. So very well known in that way. But Sound Factory, totally separate building on Selma, a few blocks away, two rooms, um, f should be as famous, but for the sort of era that you were there, actually. Yeah. Um, did you, were you going back and forth between, like, when did you become sort of ensconced at Sound Factory? Was it when you were working with clients who were always there or were you sort of assigned there even before that? It was, it was the clients there. Um, you know, there were five rooms and basically the assistants would get assigned to kind of whatever room was open. And if they've developed a reputation with some of the clients, then that's kind of where they ended up, you know, um, I was there with a really good group of guys. Like everybody was anal retentive. Somehow there was this competition amongst almost everybody of 
like labeling the tape boxes the same way. Like for some reason, we all gravitated toward the same colors on the tape boxes. The rooms were always neat. They were always put back together properly. The consoles were always zero. We, we all took a lot of pride in the place and having it work the way it did. And, you know, I was there with Mike Persante, who ended up working for T-Bone Burnett. Yeah. Neil Avron was a little bit before me. Um, but who started you know, off as a tech there and then became and then, an assistant and then exactly. moved on. Exactly. Yeah. And Rich was a tech there at the time. But, yeah, mm -hmm. great group. Now, so the assistants could move back and forth, but unless I'm completely wrong, which I certainly could be, it doesn't seem like very many clients would go back and forth. They either worked at Sunset or they worked at Sound Factory. Is that true or did I make that up? No, that that is generally true. Um, Sound Factory was the smaller overdub budget place. You know, that's Though the way strangely, it was looked at. Strangely, I probably had my favorite live room of all five studios was Studio A over there. I hated the control room, yeah. but yeah. the live room was incredible. Yeah, yeah. Designed originally for the Rolling Stones, but they never st set foot in the place. <laughs> A guy named David Hassinger set the place up. Right. And that room, you know, I it's it's funny. I'm still discovering records that were done there. Seals and Crofts records, Summer Breeze was done in Studio A at wow. Sound Factory. Linda Ronstadt records and, you know, Val Garay, that was his place, you know, Studio A. And Nico Bolas came up through there and and a lot of cool records were done in that in that room. Right. Wow. Um but but yeah, so so to answer your question, I think people thought of sound factory as more of a budget place and um and but sunset was the big dog and then the big rooms and and the, the bigger reputation obviously right so yeah so i basically ended up at sound factory um on a los lobos record i had i had assisted chad and mitchell once for a few days on a record by this guy named peter case and um he was in that band, the Plim Souls, and yeah. um, you know, early on. And anyway, um, the only thing Chad and Mitchell said to me was they gave me their food order every day: a vegetable sandwich, <laughs> a pink cloud, and Native American corn chips from this place that used to be up the street. That was the only thing they said to me. And then a few months later, um, I get a call from Sunset Studio Manager and says, "Oh, well." Chad and Mitchell are going into Los to work with Los Lobos in Studio B at Sound Factory. Bring a good book. I'm putting you on it because there wasn't a lot of work that summer for some reason. And he felt bad. And none of the other assistants wanted to work with Chad. Well, not because he was mean, right? Just no, because, because he did everything. And right, he didn't there's... ask and he just, he knew the rooms really well and, and he didn't, yeah, he just didn't want he just didn't care. He just kind of, this is what I'm doing, and that's what right. he did. Right, so you would have so. nothing to do. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I wasn't going to allow that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, another, another example of the taking charge. Yeah, I, I sat between Chad and the Patch Bay, and I figured after three days, he would get tired of walking around me. And Sound Factory was small, with yeah, Studio yeah. B in particular. And I figured he would start asking me things or he would get tired of coming around me. But either way, like I would, you know, I'd know where I stood. And, and basically, I ended up stuck at, not stuck at Sound Factory, I'm doing that in quotes, but um, was because I, Chad loved it. Chad loved having me around and me, paying attention to everything and wanting to be involved. And, you know, I assisted those guys maybe four years, yeah. four or five years. I think I was involved with those guys as an assistant. Yeah. yeah a long time. I mean, we should talk about some of those records if you want mm -hmm. to, because there are yeah. some amazing records. I mean, obviously, well, we could start with, with Los Lobos because mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great way to go in too. Cause now was that, that was the record where, uh, and I again, I could be wrong with this because I know Chad at one point was trying to chase the more traditional thing, almost the Clear Mountain thing and stuff like that. And finally he just said, him. fuck that. 
I am mm-hmm. not, I can't do it, and I'm not going to do it. And was that Los Lobos record kind of the first record where he's like, I'm doing whatever the hell I want to do, and let's that was see it. what happens. Right. That was it. Yeah. And, you know, I guess he and Mitchell had had a discussion about it, too, because Chad loved Bob Clear Mountain. Yeah. And, and still does. And you, yep. and you can hear it. You can really hear it in his mixes. It's just his mixes just go down a whole octave or even two more than Bob's. But the separation and the kind of, you know, all that clarity and the energy of it. Um, yeah, all that's there. But yeah, that was when they said, fuck it, basically, right. both of them. Um, and then, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm this guy from from college. And, and when we got into the L.A. scene, that was not a normal thing. Yeah. A lot of people resented it. Like I, I remember one of my first assisting gigs. I had mentioned, oh, yeah, I went to the University of Miami. I went, got a, you know, I studied this in school. And the guy was just like, yeah, I swept, you know, I cleaned toilets and swept them, blah, 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 blah. And I never told anybody again from that point. It was just, there was, it was, there was no point in. Yeah, it was a real stigma to have gone flouting to any, yeah, flouting any credentials. So not that they're real credentials, but, you know, it's just, you don't want to intimidate or make anybody feel weird. Not that they should be intimidated by some kid, but you know what I mean? Um, but with Chad, you know, Chad is this guy who so worked so hard for what he did, huge artistry in him to begin with. He's a great musician. I don't know if you've heard him play guitar. He, he's a great guitar player and he's got a great feel and a great groove. And, you know, I think he toured the world with an Elvis Costello, not Elvis Costello and Elvis Presley, um, impersonator really he toured africa africa with the guy and yeah played wow. vegas and stuff and and so so here i am this guy who went to jazz school and have all this thing and chad is just he's just immersed and worked his ass off um and we would sit around for hours waiting for los lobos to show up and but we both kind of had this common thing i mean he was really into the white album the beatles white album So we would show up every day and we would sit there and listen to the white album for at least a couple of hours every day. And, and, and that's how I kind of got to know him. And it was a weird common thread and common thing for two people who would just have, you know, very different backgrounds. And, um, yeah, it was awesome. So you guys would not agree with me that that could have been a single album, would you? (laughs) The white album? Yeah. I I could easily <laughs> chop a few songs off that thing. The stuff that's I, good is probably my favorite mm-hmm. ever, but the stuff that isn't, I never really yeah. want to hear again. I get it. I get it. <laughs> well, yeah, look, I, I got I, a I, question I, for you about this because okay. it's yeah. Because so then up until that Los Lobos record, Chad mm-hmm. Mitchell had worked together a few times, but mm-hmm. all of Chad's body of work, which wasn't huge at that point, but it existed, mm-hmm. would have been this sort of modern clear mountain ish thing Mm -hmm. and the stuff he had done with mitchell was all that yeah did los lobos know going in that they were not getting that because they didn't get anything even close to that and it's a huge left turn it's not subtle it's a gigantic difference i i mean i don't know factually um i don't know what the discussions were between mitchell and them but but they were totally on board at you know for that record in particular but like um, from day one like absolutely because that record is it's fucked up in a great yeah. way but it's yeah. not it's not like a compromise it's not an easing in it's a full on yeah you know the change. other thing people don't realize about that record and he doesn't really get credit for it but there was an engineer named Paul Dugray who recorded several songs on that record and so we got those tapes from Paul and then we ended up doing overdubs on, or they ended up doing overdubs on it. And so those tracks kind of got morphed into what became Kiko. And then also the second track on the record was recorded and mixed by Kevin Killen. Right. A song called wake up Dolores. Um, but, but this was the record that Chad pulled out the sands amps. This is where the Mel- you know, Mitchell's Chamberlain got a huge workout. Um, and the band was totally on board with it. I mean, David and Louie in particular, David Hidalgo yeah. and Louis Perez. I mean, 
and that's obvious because of the stuff that came later, like Absolutely. the Latin Playboys and and yeah. Exactly. I'm just wondering if it was a bit of a surprise, you know, because it's not what anyone would have expected to get from those two at that point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I I think the band was ready for it too, or at least David and Louis and 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 right. Steve Berlin as well, you know. Um I, I think they were ready for something different because they were coming off like La Bamba and um what's that record how does the wolf survive and right and and things like that so i i think it was a real catharsis for everybody involved right yeah because you, you could know? see that they needed to go in some direction or they were yeah. just going to get pigeonholed into a very very small hole exactly yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent, and yeah. and even the way some of those tracks were recorded you know i you know, you come into things with concepts and then you work for a year as an assistant and you see things done, you know, a variety of ways, but it's kind of traditional and, and, you know, but, but now here's a tune like angels with dirty faces. Um, there's a loop on it as the basic part of the track that they looped in an H 3000 printed it on the tape. Um, P Thomas is playing drums on it. Um, there's a couple of mics up in the room and everybody's out there doing hand claps on the basic track. Mitchell Froome is standing near a piano and every once in a while, he's just hitting a couple of things. And it's Chad and I in the control room. And while this whole thing is going on and it was so cool and so freeing and really eye opening to me, it was super, super inspiring just to kind of see this kind of, you know, and then as you learn more and you think of, and you learn more about how other records are done and Beatles records and things like that, it's, it was more in the spirit of a longer line of things than what records had started to become in the nineties, you know, right. the compartmentalize, do the drums, then do the bass, then do this, then do that kind of a thing. Right. So, yeah. Cause in a way it is, it's much more traditional record making Yeah. to get yeah. the sounds as you're going and doing things live and, mm -hmm. And every yeah. song being constructed completely differently. Too. Yeah, I mean, th those guys, you know, they made the records in the moment. They really did. And you pushed up those faders and, and you know, it sounded like it was intended to sound. There wasn't any real guesswork, right. which, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. obviously, I mean, that record is pretty amazing. I think pretty influential for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I still, you know, the, the beauty of, of records and I'm sure you've done this too. Like I hear some of these songs and I remember the exact moment when stuff was done. Like I remember David's solo on, there's a tune called just a man. That's just his burning guitar solo. And I can still see myself I can still see him through the glass. Every time I hear it, it's right. really, really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. did, did they, we don't need to, you know, go too far down this rabbit hole, but it's just really interesting to me to someone who's observing it. Was Chad immediately happy sonically with where everything was going or was it a feeling out process or was it as if he was always just ready to do this and it switched on? I have a feeling it's the latter. I think he was really ready to do it. Um, he had been experimenting with things. It seems like for a long time before that. And, you know, and, and, and you have to remember, this is my, this is my in point with him. Yeah. And so over time, and the, the, the more I got to know him, the more I start to find out these things, you know, like his interest in binaural recording and his interest in, in sounds in general, and just making, you know, doing weird, stranger things, you know, but, you know, all that said, his, whoever he learned from, which I think was a, a lot of guy named Terry Christian, who was a Sunset Sound alumni who ended up working a lot for Mike, Michael Armardian right. and moved to Nashville. But Chad picked up a lot of brilliant engineering practices. And even though he took them where he took them, you know, he, he's, he's just a great engineer. Yeah. He really, really is. Was he using the, the head on drums at that point or not yet? He got that a year later. The first record he used the head on was um, for drums was the American Music Club Mercury record. Right. But he was, was still, he was already doing drums in that small booth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kiko, 
the drums were done in that small booth in that place. Yeah, yeah which, so I mean, for people who don't know, it, Studio B, the live room, was not that big. But anyone who would walk in there thinking, I'm going to record drums, would put them in the, in the big room. And there's a booth in the back that, I mean, it would be a big vocal booth, but it's not like, oh, yes, that's a drum booth. Yeah. You'd have to climb over the kit to get behind it and then be scared by the binaural head looking at you. But <laughs> some of the biggest drum sounds in the world from that tiny little room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Chad yeah. didn't like front kick drum heads, like lots of stuff that would seem very counterintuitive to getting gigantic drum sounds, but that's... Yeah. And it seems as though it's it's just, it's more like wanting complete control over the close, dry sounds to do whatever you want, as opposed to relying on acoustics in a room and distance and things like that. And that that's that's very well put. The, the interesting thing about that booth is there was a lot of glass surface area as well. There three, well, two of the, the back two walls were, the back corner was all absorptive. But the front of the booth was all glass. Right. I mean, from from about three or four feet up, you know, there was a huge pane of glass. So it wasn't completely dead. And especially once you put a couple of close mics on there and compress them. I mean, it just really the energy. I mean, you hear it on the records, but but the, it, it was amazing what that room would do. It was incredible. Yeah. Right. And did that really inform your engineering? I mean, it must have influenced you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, like, like Chad's techniques and practices, it's not like they were willy nilly, like he, you know, he definitely thought about stuff. Um, and the other thing I really learned from him is just getting it to sound right in the room before you even put a mic on it, which right. is so, you know, so ingrained in me just by watching him and what, and what he did. And, you know, and, but that Remo, he had an 18 inch, Remo kick drum without the front head, and that's that bass drum on on Kiko and on probably on Colossal Head too. Right. Um, you know, a lot of those records at that time. So. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, an amazing records. Well, you mentioned American Music Club, so we could talk mm -hmm. about that for a second. Mm -hmm. And by we, I mean you. So you can talk about that <laughs> no, for we a second. Can. <laughs> <laughs> that is. That's one of my favorite engineered records of chat um there's a depth and then there's this hi-fi quality to it at the same time that i don't you know had he continued to pursue that it you know that how can i put this that's the closest one that's the combination of chad and and maybe bob clear mountain right as far as the top end and, and, and the full spectrum thing. It still has Chad's girth and beef on the bottom and the, all the separation. It just has a bit more of a canopy over the top. So Chad probably um, thinks it's too bright then. I, I don't know. I, I've, <laughs> never, I've actually never talked to him about well, it. I'll ask but, him. Um, yeah, you should. <laughs> um, and that's also the first record he mixed at Sound Factory. Oh, right. Where had he been going to mix? He mixed... Um, he mixed Kiko and he also mixed Suzanne Vega's 99.9 .9 at um, Oceanway on that focus, right? Oh, right. Yeah. And did you and, get to go along for that or you? You know, I popped it. They had invited me to swing by, but I didn't. I I'd popped over maybe once. I don't know why I didn't. I was kind of. You might have been working, too. You know. I might have been working, but but there was there was always this kind of shyness and and not wanting to get in the way when other people were doing other things. You know, probably a little to my detriment. Looking back at it, you know, I, I think we were all the same. You know, I mean, because yeah. when you're in your studio, you have a reason to be there. But if mm -hmm. you're the assistant from the other studio, like yeah, you know, it's yeah, it's it's like going to have. You know, it's like the times I've showed up at mix sessions for things that I tracked. And, you know, you hear it a certain way and the guy who's mixing it, they're doing something. And it's just like, then I had to leave. I couldn't sit through that. And, and you know, not that, you know, it's just you hear it a certain way and you're so used to it yeah. that, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't separate myself. So I knew to stay away from those. So what made Chad decide to mix that at Sound Factory then? Just logistics probably or? Flying faders. 
That right. was the first time they put flying faders on that console. They had a knee cam system, which was an old yeah. antiquated crawling faders automation. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was just horrible to use. And sound factory um, put in flying faders in 92 right. in, in studio B. And yeah, so that was the first one he mixed on there. And I'd already known flying faders from my time working at other studios. Cause I had worked in a lot of knee V series rooms. Right. So it was perfect because I already knew I could get Chad up and going quickly on that. And yeah, it was good. Right. Well, look, we can't leave the Los Lobos thing without talking about Latin Playboys. Okay. So Mm -hmm. you're going to talk about Latin Playboys because that to me is, it's a seminal record. I mean, musically, it's amazing. And for Mm -hmm. David and Jack, like it's all of that. But it's one of the few times outside of like the Eno and Lanois camp where an engineer is as much the artist as anything else. And Chad will say, I didn't do anything. It was all on four track recorded. Like, and I'm sure it was super cool coming off that four track. But mm-hmm. to say he didn't do anything is insane. Right. Right. Um, well, this is around the same period. I, I, I'm probably going to refer to Colossal Head a little bit too at the same yeah, yeah, time. That's all right. Because because this was all kind of happening around the same time. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the songs that didn't make Colossal Head ended up on the Latin Playboys, that song New Zandu. Oh, right. And that was actually recorded during the, the Colossal Head sessions. Um, but they had really... I mean, Chad and Mitchell were really feeling it at that point. They had done a few records in a row and there was some, there was just, you know, they were feeling it. They, they were definitely free. And the Los Lobos guys came in with Colossal Head with no songs written. And that record was done in like three weeks from like no songs to, you know, or maybe Caesar had a couple of songs. Right. Um, but we were working at 15 ips at that point chad was fully fully into you know the sans amps and the delays on the vocals and really making things explode and so through all of that david had brought in a couple of cassette demos of things he was doing um I th- is the last song on Colossal Head, Buddy Epson Loves the Nighttime? I, I'm not th- going to know off the top of my okay. head. I, th- I think Let's it is. Let's say it is. And I Mark think will correct it is. this, but yeah, we'll, yeah. For this reality, it is. Okay. And so that was one of the ones that was based on one of David's cassettes. Right. So I think what happened was, is then that evolved into David, Louie, Chad, and Mitchell talking. And then that's kind of where the Latin Playboys came out of. Right. So David realizing, like, if he demoed this stuff, it could live on and it wasn't just demos. And Yeah. And these was, this was just him fooling around in his kitchen, you know, well, with a four track. I mean, and a lot what of it. Chad had, had said in the past that it was because they just had so much fun making Colossal Head. They didn't want it to stop. Yeah. But they couldn't just book the studio indefinitely. So... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, like I said, I think it was a really, you know, if, if, if Kiko was like the glimpse of freedom, Colossal Head was just like, well, here we go. And, and, you know, there was, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like what, you know, how, A, how fast it all came together, but, but there's so much joy in that record in a way that that i just you know and the experimentation and the the you know pete thomas taking his top head off the snare and literally sticking his stick in and playing just the thin paper bottom snare (laughs) for one tune you know i mean the grooves are all weird on a couple of tunes one of them's in an odd time signature another one just all turned around and um so yeah, I think it was really freeing for them. And then I think when David brought in the cassette machine, I think, uh, you know, like I said, those four guys, I think their eyes just all kind of opened up. And so they would just dump stuff on the tape and, and then they would play. Basically, they would take some of this form and, you know, and, and just play. Right Now, at the same time, I had a producer who wanted me to engineer some stuff for him. 
and Chad would let me start, get him set up in the morning for the Latin Playboys, hop in my car, drive to Brentwood for a couple of hours, do overdubs with this producer, wow. and then drive back to Sound Factory and finish up. So That's amazing. Yeah, he, the, Chad and Mitchell were great about that. They were really supportive of me getting and, you know, and, and finding my way. Well, you could um, see them being supportive, but saying, but we got to get someone else in here. So it's an amazing yeah. thing to say, nope, you're the man, you're part of the team, but go do your yeah. thing. Yeah, no, it's very, very fortunate. And, and you know, because Chad, I mean, still to this day, like, I feel like when I see Chad, I need to take care of him. And I, and, and it, it, it's out of respect. It's not out of, you know, anything else other than that's my role with him. And that's kind of what I built myself into. And, and I'm happy about it. You know, I really, really am. So... Um, so I would come back though, and the stuff that would come out of the speakers were, were just incredible. And then, you know, they were doing all this crazy stuff, like that song, the Dumbo song, you know, mm -hmm. Mira Dumbo. And, you know, we stood outside and put up microphones and just to be outside and get the traffic noise. And, and there was this guy named Rick who was friends with the band who's cracking up the entire time. And, and, and it, it was just, it was really just free and joyous. It really, really was. It seems like there's a sense of the, like you just, they couldn't go wrong. It didn't matter what they tried. It always worked. Yeah. And yep. that's got to just feel like magic. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I mean, we experience this when we mix sometimes, you know, I, we? I, 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 well, I, I mean, I, I feel like <laughs> I, I do some, you know, those moments when you, when, you know, when you're lucky enough to get lost and you're lucky enough to feel like, you know, that, that it's coming through you as opposed to you having to force your way into something, you right. know, I mean, you know, I'm fortunate enough to feel that way when I play sometimes as well, you know, and, and you as a, as a trumpeter as oh, well. Oh God, right? no, and never. You, no. Oh, come on, man. I had, had I had about a minute and a half during a solo in high school when we went mm -hmm. to play some like big band festival thing. And I was doing my like really bad electric miles, but I had a wah wah pedal and a delay. And I did some weird arpeggiated thing that was yes. coming back on itself. And that was awesome. But literally 30 seconds in my entire <laughs> trumpet playing career. That's it. That's but all you, you get. felt it. You felt it, and you know that it was possible. Yeah, right? but I would have. I could have gone for more than thirty seconds of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, you guys, you guys had years of it. Yeah, really, yeah. right? I mean, it's not like oh, that record went great, and then the next few were difficult or whatever. It seemed as though just cranking them out one right after another. It was. It was quite. It was quite the couple of years and, and, and there were some twists and turns in there and things that, that had, you know, that had come up that were unexpected, but, but every time it was just, you know, and then me and Chad in particular, because Chad had mixed a couple of records and produced a couple of records without Mitchell. Um, I'm thinking mainly the Sam Phillips, Martinis and Bikinis record, right. um, Soul Coughing's first record. Yeah. Which I definitely, I want to talk about that specifically in a minute. Okay. Okay. But, but, you know, there were, there were, there were, there's three or four years there that were just, you know, it, they were on a roll. They were doing amazing things and it was fun. It really was. And it got to the point where, you know, like Chad and I would show up and we wouldn't talk for the first couple of hours just because <laughs> we knew it had to be done. I knew his setup. I knew how to hook it all up and, and, you know, and, and that was it. It, but, but it was not for want to, it was not for being bored. It was just like, you know, it was a real spirit kind of, right. you know. And it's it not like there was a lack of effort. I mean, you guys were working oh, your asses no. off. Totally, totally. And, and I've said this for years, you know, eight hours with Chad and Mitchell was like 12 hours with anybody else I've ever worked with because of their focus. I mean, they showed up to work. I mean, the other funny thing about Mitchell is that during Kiko, I mean, we worked on Kiko for six weeks. I think he said five words to me in those six weeks because he would show up and he's showing up thinking about music right? and thinking about what he wanted to try for the day. And that's how Mitchell's mind works. And he's into economy and he's into arrangement and just putting things together in a certain way, you know, but 
So ironically, like one of the best compliments I'd ever gotten was from Mitchell after those six weeks, he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you did a really amazing job. Thank you. And that was <laughs> and it. And what's your name again? Because we haven't spoken. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, but just the fact that he took the time to acknowledge it, it that really made me feel good. You yeah. know, I never took anything personally. I just kind of figured, well, this is, this is how this guy is. Right, and, right. But to realize you know, that he is aware of what's going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really nice. That's great. Totally. Well, and obviously the, the Low Slowest thing didn't stop with just those two records because you worked on the, uh, the Feeling Minnesota score. With yeah, they, too, hired right? me to, they hired me to do that. Yeah, I drove out to, um, to Diamond Bar every day for a couple of months and then so la to diamond bar that was a 45 minute drive easy on like a no traffic day sometimes it took me an hour and 15 hour and a half the good thing was you couldn't be late because they were always going to be later than you exactly and <laughs> and i actually got really frustrated with them at one point <laughs> because of it i remember i remember that actually yeah but, yeah but still no. i mean that's a great opportunity too it was it was my mm -hmm. first co-production credit actually i have co-production credit in the film yeah with those guys and and i got one of the greatest quotes i had ever heard anybody say from david hidalgo um he played this beautiful line at one point and i said david where did that come from and he literally just looked at me and says i don't know i guess my reception's just good today <laughs> and i was just like brilliant yeah yeah, that guy, that guy is one of the best musicians I've ever seen, like the deepest feel. He could hit the top of a table. He could hit a cowbell. And it's the most soulful thing you've ever heard in your entire life. He's right. just he's just that good. Yeah. Amazing. So. Well, OK, let's let's talk about soul coughing, because I want to talk. Cause, okay. I mean, first of all, I love Ruby Vroom. Is this such a uh -huh. great record? But mm -hmm. also. It took me a long time, and I know I'm really late to the party, but I finally just listened to the new Fiona Apple, which isn't even that new anymore, the mm -hmm. Fetch the Bolt Cutters, and Sebastian is in her band, mm -hmm. so he's all yeah. over that record. And I knew it as soon as I heard the first note out of his bass, like, hold on a second, that's Sebastian. So, <laughs> But those guys, I mean, so unconventional at the time, and again, a perfect marriage with mm -hmm. Chad and with you. And I'd, so I'd love to hear about sort of how that came together and what it was like to kind of make the record, because it's not like other records. No, no, definitely not. Um, again, like another really fast record. Um, you know, I've been doing this kind of deep dive on Van Halen since Ed died. And, uh, you know, Van Halen's thing in their first record was done really fast. That's because the band was super well rehearsed and they'd been playing constantly all the time. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is Soul Coughing was the same situation. Those guys were playing around New York like crazy. They were on fire. Um, I'm not sure how Chad got the call to do it. Um, you know, I think they were on Slash Records, which was a division of, of Warner Brothers. And um, but those guys came in and it was like kill the man with the ball. Like <laughs> it was all this awesome New York energy. And they came in just they were just ready to kill it. And from the moment we set up and then, you know, they totally embraced Chad's compression thing. This was, I, I want to say this was the first record where Chad put the head down low and right in front of the drummer. Right. Um, so it's like right over the toms, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. So literally, if you're the drummer, like you have this face, like literally it's like <laughs> right there. And, um, but totally embraced by, by the drummer Yuval and... Um, yeah, it was kind of a simple setup. There was a bathroom right, there was a ramp that you would take down into the main performance area and there was a bathroom right off there. And so guitar amps would end up in there, sax players would end up in there over the years. And so it was probably, you know, upright bass and the amp in the main room, I think. Um, the keyboard player was all synths and all samplers. And then Dodie was singing. And then also, um, you know, we ran a guitar line out to his, to the bathroom basically. And, you know, a couple of takes each tune and, and we got them. 
and a couple of overdubs here and there. And, and the energy was just another thing where they were just so excited and so right so happy and it's a real sample heavy record but those mm -hmm. samples are all triggered live as part of the performance right i mean that, exactly. there's no there's no pre-record there's no going back and chopping things up it's like that's what they did exactly exactly so that was a big component i'm sure there were some overdubs here and there like you know i'm sure there were a couple of vocal passes and vocal comps things like that um but the main core of the tracking a lot of it was recorded right then and there um yeah but they were they were just totally on fire. And then, um, and it was awesome. I was going to be in New York that summer. I ended up doing live sound for them during, uh, what's that CMJ? Oh, CMJ Is that the yeah. 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 So I got to mix at CBGB's nice. and, and two other clubs for them. And, uh, it was really fun. Wow. That was super fun. And, and, uh, but yeah, Doty was, Doty was great. Um, they had this really great song at the time. There was that woman, Amy Fisher. Right. Who shot, she, she had gotten involved with some guy and then ended up shooting the guy's wife. Oh yeah. 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 Some guy named Joe, Joey Buttafuco. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They, they, they had a song called Amy Fisher that they, they used to play and, and that never made the record, but, but they were just, <laughs> they were just funny and fun and, and yeah. But like I said, 10 days. 10 days of tracking a week, two weeks of mixing tops. Done. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And, yep. and Sebastian sound it's, it's DI and amp, right? I mean, there are no mics on the upright, are there? No, no mics on the upright. And Chad probably sans amped it as well. I, right. I, so, so there might be those three components. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it is it is just an record. incredible. I mean, I suppose it's it's almost like the Latin Playboys has the same thing where the it goes so lo-fi in a way that it sounds completely natural. Yeah, yeah. That and it's just you don't know how to record it, so it sounds like that. But it's just a recording of something that happened. It's not processed <laughs> and crazy and weird. Exactly. Yeah, he's you know that's that's the magic of Chad right there. And it's just how he hears it. Um, you know, one, yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, I, I've talked about this before, but man, that black sky mix he did by Sam Phillips. Oh have you yeah. Ever yeah. I yeah. mean, he spent three days on it, but, but that's like, that was the most incredible thing. It's still probably the most incredible mix from a perspective standpoint that I've ever heard in my now, life. Is that the one with all the amps out in the live room or is it a different yeah. Right. Yeah. You want it, well, you should tell the, for the kids, yeah. tell the kids for the about kids, that. Chad set up his binaural head in the performance area of Sound Factory. And he, using QSENs and using buses on the console, fed multi-track elements out to speakers and then had the head come up on the stereo bus of the console. So he would position these things around the head and basically did a, in a weird way, it's a mechanical mix. He would move stuff in and out. He would change volumes and things. But the net effect was the very first sound you hear, because, um, you know, with stereo sounds, and in headphones in particular, sounds come from left and right in your ears, and then they tend to go upward. And so the center things tend to feel like they're above your head, right? And... But with binaural recordings, you have this whole other dimension of in front of you and behind you. So the very first sound you hear comes from almost behind you on your left side. And then the vocal comes in and the vocal comes in in front of you and just off to your right a little bit. And then this tambourine comes in on the right. And that's the basis of the song. And then these background vocals come in and they feel like because they're in the stereo bus of the console, he didn't send them out they feel like they're this coming in over your head and just floating above you. Right. And man, it was brilliant. And he started on a Friday and I was coming in the next morning to do a demo <laughs> and I show up, I was mixing a demo or something. I show up, he's still there. He's like, Oh man, he goes, I'll, I'll, I'll be done in like 20 minutes. <laughs> and I saw everything he had going on <laughs> and, and I'm just like, no, no, I'll come back tomorrow. Don't worry. I come back on Sunday. So was he's someone else there. assisting him? No, no. He's just doing it by just himself. Just by himself. Yeah, we had keys. I mean, he had always kept his keys because he was a Sound Factory assistant. So right. 
that's the other thing why he did everything by himself because he, he right. knew the place better than anybody. Um, so yeah. So, so yeah, I came back the third day and he's still there, but, and <laughs> then, but he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He hadn't left. He slept on the couch in the lounge and, and, but he played it for me and it was, it was one of my two favorite things that I, that he's ever done. Um, and, and I, I, I couldn't tell him to, you know, I, I couldn't say stop, you know, how could I, how could yeah. I do that? And, and so he was exhausted and he printed it and, and I think I just came back on Monday morning. I said, just leave your stuff, leave everything. I'll document it and then I'll break it all down. And that's what I did. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it's also, it's, it's such a different era of like, he could do that. And then it isn't like, okay, send it out and wait for all the comments. Like that mix yeah. was just done. I presumably yeah. Mitchell heard it done or no, cause Mitchell wasn't involved was in that. T-Bone, it was T-Bone and Sam. And yeah. so did they come in and listen or it was just like, that's it. He just, he just kind of sent it to him and said, I did this. And I mean, if they didn't like that, this... he would have just done a traditional mix. Probably. Sorta, yeah. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yep. cause you can't even imagine not getting comments on a mix now. Like that's yeah. w what situation does that ever come up? I mean, every once in a while you get lucky and there are almost no comments, but yep. the idea is you're going to get comments and change the mix. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's the process now. You never it say is. I'm done. Yeah. Here you go. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I, what do you think? What do you want to change? And so yeah. it's amazing. And it, and, yeah. it, and I suppose it takes that situation to free you up to do mm -hmm. something like that. Because if he knew he was then going to have two days back and forth with T-Bone, especially if T-Bone wasn't even going to come to the studio and like, yeah. you'd never do it. You would mm -hmm. never, ever, ever do it. Exactly. Exactly. I think he, yeah, he, he wanted to do it just because he was inspired. And again, it's like one of the things about Chad, that's just so incredible, right? This, the artistic streak in him that, that just always needed to express itself in, in one way or another. Right. Which was, you know, probably the most inspirational thing about him to me. Right. You know, and, and, you know, the work ethic, the focus, all of those things. And, and that's really what I took from him. Right, with all of that time. Well, yeah. you you mentioned Pete Thomas, so we can't we can't just skip no, over can't. Pete. Oh, Thomas. absolutely. So yep. we can start. So Pete Thomas, uh, he, he's an imposter. He's Elvis's longtime drummer. Mm -hmm. So yep. you guys worked on a couple a couple of Elvis records during that time. At yeah, least one. I was one. involved with one. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you've obviously done tons of stuff with Pete since. <sighs> I mean, yeah, I mean, well, I met Pete on Kiko because he was a drummer on Kiko. So I've known Pete since, yeah, the summer of 91. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had last week was Dave Way, who's obviously mm -hmm. done a little bit of work with a little band called Jack Shit lately. Yeah, he did He did the third record. I did yes. the first two. Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. I, I love how the first, well, the first session came about. Oh, right. the first Jack shit re s yeah. session. Well, first it, it's basically the first record. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, uh, so the the I mean, the backstory is, um, you know, Pete Mitchell at some point started using Val McCallum and Davy Farragher, Farragher along with Pete Thomas as kind of a rhythm section on some of the records when Mitchell and Chad had stopped working together as much, I had done a few records with Mitchell. I did a Joan Osborne record and this girl called Bonnie pink. And then a few other things with Mitchell at that time, we did a Bonnie rate track, I think. And yeah. so, so Pete Val and Davey were like the core rhythm section at that point. Mitchell also at the time was involved with Vonda Shepard, who he eventually married and Vonda was involved with the Ally McBeal TV show. Yeah. So Vonda kind of absorbed Val, Pete, and Davey as the rhythm section for the Ally McBeal show for her music on it. And then I got, fortunately, was kind of pulled into that as well. And so I was recording those guys all the time. And so we were at Conway one day, set up for a session, and we get a call. Um, this was when Robert Downey Jr. was on the show. 
and he had gotten busted for some drug thing where he had he was on something, fell asleep in some house, whatever, got arrested. So basically the studio time was paid for for the day. So we called the producer and said, hey, can we use the studio time? I had a couple of reels of tape and we aligned the machine at 15 ips and we recorded the whole Jack shit record that afternoon, <laughs> except for the very last song. And, and they'd been, they, I mean, Jack shit was already a thing, right? They were already they, playing baked potato and, and McCabe's. They, yeah. And, they had yeah. started doing, yeah, they, you know, they'd probably done, you know, half a dozen shows at that point. I mean, I don't think it was that far into it. Right. And so we would cut a track without the vocal. And when we got the, when they got all the way through and we're happy, okay, done. <laughs> then we went back to the top of the tape put it in record. They sang all the way down. Okay. What's the next song? And that's literally the way we did it. And then we went back. I was living in Burbank at the time. Uh, we did a day of overdubs and that's where all the moves came from and a few other things that are interspersed with the record. And then we cut the very last track. It's called uh, hold that critter down in this little bedroom in Burbank. It was the first real home recording I've ever done. Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of takes and then we, we, I think I did another pass of background vocals and done. And that's how, that's how the first record was done. Super fun. And it's great. And I got to say with Pete, I've only been able to record him a few times, but mm -hmm. he always says, and I try not to take it personally, like he mm -hmm. comes in and you always come up and we start talking about, she's like, you know, among other things. <laughs> my headphones would always sound amazing with John. And all I can think is, are you saying this because they don't sound so good now? Mm. Like, why are you bringing that up? But yeah, he uh, love loved, Pete. loved, loved, loved when you recorded him. Absolutely we, loved it. Yeah, we really have, a, we've got a great relationship working together and, you know, and a lot of trust. And that's what it developed over time. And and that was through the alley thing and, and, I mean, the alley thing was a great training ground because, you know, we were, rec we were cutting three or four songs a day and I right. had to cut them and mix them. And, you know, and my goal was always, okay, it's for a TV, but, but it was always about making records as quickly as possible and economizing it all on one reel of tape. And, you know, so toms were folded into the overheads all the time and, you know, and getting those blends and committing to them and, and that whole spirit. Um, yeah, but Pete's phenomenal. I mean, he's just, he's a great energy. He's so studied. Um, yeah. I mean, even to this day, it's like you go to his house, he's practicing. All the time. And yeah, yeah, he is so committed, so committed. Yeah. All the time. And yeah. one of the best walking ads for the baked potato ever born. <laughs> of course. <laughs> 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 and whoever makes those shorts anyways we, it comes up it comes up it came up with dave because i mean that's his it's his uniform it's it. for, it for is, playing totally. drums yeah yeah it's always yep. funny to see him like dressed up you know to mm -hmm. go out to eat or something like that because of course you know he's he's a yeah. stylish man yeah yeah and he's playing like, drums but he's like a six foot four marty feldman that's yeah. the other thing and and the personality's great and the animation the whole thing yeah and he's he's just one of the loveliest people but he's the awesome. studying i mean because it's not just the the parts too it's the drum kit it's showing up with a particular snare that he thinks is going to be the right thing for this song oh and yeah no he's just yeah he's again like that whole thing about mitchell thinking about the session before he walks in and you know pete coming in with the concept and then still being flexible enough to have it be changed on him as well i mean because that's a mark of a professional and being open but but yeah and, and then pete you know learns the song immediately charts it out um you know gets the tempo the whole thing i mean yeah. so committed and and just loves to play you know yeah and and he and, and Davey are such a battery together too. I, I mean, was just they, gonna say, Davey, yeah. Davey again. Like, there's David Hidalgo, there's Davey Farragher, and and you know, there's maybe a handful of other musicians that I would just consider at that level. I mean, Davey Farragher, I worked with that guy for three years, and he never made a mistake, ever. <laughs> like, we never fixed him. And then finally, one day, he says, "Can we fix this?" And it was marginal at best. Like, like anybody else would have let it go. And so I had to fix one note. Right. Um, we cut a Jack Shitch tune one time and it was in one key and then Val changes guitars and the guitar must have been tuned either up or down a half step. They launch into it and Davey plays it down like nothing. 
and we get done and Davey's like, well, are we doing it or in E or an F? <laughs> it didn't phase him either way. No, and, well, part of that's got to be, I, I mean, because this is later on, but I know mm -hmm. on the, um, I can't remember the names of the tours, but the Elvis Costello tours where he had the huge wheel with all yeah. the songs on it and they'd mm -hmm. spin the wheel and yeah. it would land on a song and so he would just launch into the song. And mm -hmm. until Pete pointed it out to me, it hadn't occurred to me that he and Davey cannot see the fucking wheel. <laughs> they have no idea what song is coming. And then just to mess with them, Elvis mm -hmm. would play it in a different key. It's like the Bob Dylan thing, the same thing. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, we're doing it in C sharp tonight, motherfuckers, and I'm not yeah, telling yeah. you. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Like, they never knew what song was coming. And just from the intro, they would have mm -hmm. to like, oh, okay, and it's in this key, and they'd be there. Yeah. And yeah. so the two of them together are just, I mean, and their feels yeah. obviously match up in a way that's just incredible. It's really amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And then Val, Val is like, Val is like the 18 wheeler going down a hill, a steep <laughs> hill. And I mean this in like the best possible way, like this abandon when he plays and you don't know if the brakes are going to work or not. And yeah. Even when you see him playing, you can, you know, he, he, uh, he projects that a little bit in one way, but but man, he's such a beautiful player, Val. Well, and it makes and it so own... exciting because you know yeah. he's really going for something. Yeah. And he, all, I don't think I've ever heard mm -hmm. him not make it, but no, but it no. feels like it's exciting. Yeah, it's really really exciting. And then you see a Jack shit show, and you <laughs> and they're hilarious on top of it, but you don't. It's like you, then you realize how great they are. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it. Like you can bring anybody to a Jack shit show and they're going to, they're going to get it. But the musicians, they're the ones who just really, and then Davey singing, Val singing. I mean, yeah. both those guys well, sing Pete incredibly sings, well. Yeah, you know. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. So those records were really fun to do. The second one, they, I didn't record the whole second one. Somebody did it in, they went to Oklahoma or something and recorded some stuff. And it was funny because whoever the engineer was wouldn't write out the word shit on anything. It would be like Jack S H dot dot or dash dash. <laughs> yeah. It was well, pretty funny. They're wholesome yeah. up there. Yes, exactly. They're wholesome. Exactly. So look, before we get off the, the Chad and Mitchell train, mm -hmm. which is a quite yeah. a nice train to be on, but there's one mm -hmm. other thing I want you to talk about because I think it's a great okay example of kind of the way things must have been feeling in the studio but it's also it's a great thing for anybody to do and it's mic of the day <laughs> could you please explain right. to the children what mic yeah. of the day is because it's such a great concept chad what do you want to use what's out there km86 let's use that chad what do you want to use on this next overdub Let's use the KM86. <laughs> How about this next one? Let's use the KM86. And it literally just evolved like that. And and I I don't know that there was ever an official pronouncement, like, oh, we're going to use this mic today. But it was just like, what's out there? What's closest? And, you know, and I, at that point, I knew where he would place things. So it wouldn't even be, you know, so literally whatever was close. That's what we would use. Obviously, if it sounded terrible, then okay. But but 95% of the time, we went with what was there. A couple of shots of EQ if needed. Done. Yeah. But it was, yeah. And it's a great exercise because people mm -hmm. get so hung up on like, what's the best thing to do for something? And there is no mm -hmm. best thing. There yeah. are a thousand good answers and 4,000 bad answers that yeah. can be turned into good answers. And then there are like mm -hmm. 10 answers that will never work. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I will say one other thing. One of the other things that I feel like I really got out of that experience was keeping, insisting in general, was keeping things artist-centric. Um, you know, they were there to play. And our jobs were to make it as comfortable as possible for them to do their thing. And that's the other reason I think I stayed so long and why we all hit it off so well, me and Chad and Mitchell, because, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, we weren't messing around. It was really all about the focus on the artist and on the performances. And so we would build these little things in to keep ourselves interested 
you know, not that we weren't interested, but yeah, just to kind of, yeah. it was our way of experimenting. But it, but it, it never felt never like you're, the, yeah, it's, you're not taking it lightly. It's, yeah. you got to record it with something. Yeah. And it was never, and it was never right in, in, it was never to sacrifice the performance or whatever else was going on. Right. You know? And in a lot but of that, ways, you're preserving the performance because they can record five seconds after they think about it. Not, oh, hold yeah. on, let me go get the mic. Let's like, no, just go. It's yeah. going to work. It's a good microphone in a good room. Yeah, like, exactly. What could go wrong? Yep. Yeah. You know, 100%. people love like the the drum sound that Susan got on whichever song it was, where the power supply for the API there was no negative supply, like, <laughs> and a fifty seven rolled into the floor. Like, yeah, just yeah. get over it. Yeah, and yeah. musical it'll happen. It's about what's on the other side of the mic. It's not yeah. really about the mic. It just isn't. Yeah. yeah. So look, I'm sure they're going to come up again cuz mm -hmm. whatever. They're they're important parts of your your career, mm -hmm. but you mentioned uh Joe Ciccarelli. Uh-huh. So he had you come up to the Bay Area to engineer a record. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so let's just talk about you and Joe for a bit. Why yeah, not? This band this band called Box Set and this was 95, 96 somewhere in there, I think. And yeah, I, not exactly sure why he hired me. I, I think he was kind of into the sound of the Chad and Mitchell records and, and, you know, obviously knew I worked on them and, and I, I must've run into him one or two times after I'd met him initially. I don't, I didn't remember how it all came about, but yeah, I drove up to the Bay area like three times to work on this in different sections. And we worked at this place. It was called coast at one point, but when I was there, it was called toast. It was a Bill Putnam room. <laughs> And like had the, a sign, in it. the sign broke, so they changed the name. Like that seems well, whoever like a really took it over, yeah, yeah. Whoever took it over <laughs> called it toast, and the and the the business card had like a piece of toast with a bite taken out of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, so I went up there and did that with him, and I ended up mixing that record as well at Sound Factory, and that was that was a crazy experience too because um, I learned a ton. Um, I had never seen anybody find the spot in the room for drums before right and this is something i learned from you mm -hmm. and i still yeah. still do it so this is this is a great thing for people who yeah. haven't recorded drums a lot or even we, people who have yeah we, we we picked an area of the room where we thought it would work and then set up the kick and the snare and then just moved it around a little bit like a foot here a foot there blah 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 left to right and then suddenly we found the spot it sounded great and then we built the rest of the kit around it that was probably the most important thing I took from that entire session. Right. Um, and the other thing is, you know, engineering for an engineer, especially one as good as Joe, posed a, a lot of um, interesting things, you know, like it really pushed me. Like I felt like I brought a lot to it, which was awesome. But he's doing things like he's, he's over with a, um, a pull textile EQ, the TLA, whatever the, EQP, whatever, blah, 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 right? It's, it's like pull tech style, and then it's got the filter on the low end. And then he's going, okay, what do you like better? This and this. And I'm not like seeing his hand moving. And all he's doing is he's cracking open the low cut filter. And I swear, Andrew, the first few times he did it, I'm like, I'm not hearing this. I, I suck. This is like, I'm, I'm quitting now. <laughs> it's like, I should be able to hear this. And finally, eventually, yes, I heard it. And it's like, whew, okay. Right. And, and, but this is the level and it really opened my eyes to this whole other level of tweaking, you know, which again, like context is everything with anything we do. And so sometimes it's good, sometimes it isn't. And, but it really opened my eyes to the fact that these are the subtleties that we can hear. And these are the subtleties that can really start to be built into what it is we're doing. Right. Um, you know, um, yeah, I had a couple, there was, there was some funny stuff that was going on during that record. Um, there were two songwriters in the band. Uh, one of them, um, one of them had more commercial songs than the other. And I think Joe wanted to focus on the commercial songs. So the band guys were grabbing me and, and I ended up kind of in between Joe and the band. And I, I hadn't really expected that, you know, right. so I was trying to just keep things going. And it was the first time I really had to negotiate that kind of thing. And it was fine. It all worked out well in the end. But, but you know, I walk out 
and I hear the band complaining, you know, or one of the guys, oh, we're not doing my songs. And then I'm in the control room and it's just like, oh, these guys are busting my balls about, you know, doing these songs. I don't really want to do them right now. And, you know, and so that part was really funny. And, um, and then we had to cut some takes together. And, and at one point, Joe just kept coming in. Like it was a complicated edit and, you know, you know, the verse from here, the chorus from here, and that stuff takes time and you don't yeah. want to make a mistake. Yeah, and, and you don't want to get interrupted in the middle because you lose stuff. Yeah. So he kept coming in. He was impatient because Joe, gets, he gets a lot of energy and wants to go, which is, again, like, I love that. I love the moving forward and not sitting around for hours. But I had to turn around to him at one point and said, you know what? I decided I'm making a career out of this edit. So I'm just going <laughs> to, oh, oh. And, and he's great about it. Like, I think, you know, it's not like he's doing it maliciously. He's right. just like, he's just ready to go. And then, oh, oh, okay. All right. I'll give you time. And I'm like, I'll come out and get you. I promise. And um, yeah, and I got it done and it was, it was pretty funny. Right. But, well, um, and actually I've just, I want to come back step one step back though, because mm -hmm. I want to talk about your transition out of the, chad and mitchell camp because obviously mm -hmm. they sort of separated and things but you were still working with chad mm -hmm. and then obviously you transitioned out and husky transitioned in did mm -hmm. you guys overlap and it was sort of a natural one person taking over was was there a specific thing or was it just like it was time to move on and that was that there were I mean, I alluded to this earlier. There, there were a lot of things going on, like that period of Colossal Head, and, and there were like four or five records, like right in a row. And there were some extenuating circumstances. I, I, we all worked our ass off, asses off around that time. And I ended up doing a lot of engineering at that time, a lot of recording. Um, I did a lot of, like, I think I recorded all the vocals on Colossal Head. I did a lot of overdubs on it as well. And so you get your, your appetite wet for being in the seat. And then yeah. it's just not as it's, it's harder to watch, watch other people work. It just is. And so that was starting to happen to me a little bit at that point. Um, Chad and Mitchell were starting to like have different interests. Um, I think I had talked to two or three people about replacing me. And Husky was one of them. And, and so that's, you know, part of the reason he got it was because I thought he would be the better fit right. for Chad. And, um, and then I got a call from this producer named Brad Wood, who did mm -hmm. Liz Fair. He's a Chicago guy. And he was doing this band called That Dog Yeah, that Lenny Warnker's daughter was in. And uh, Charlie Hayden's, a couple of Charlie Hayden's daughters were in the band. And the drummer was this guy named Tony. Tony somehow wanted me to record the record or wanted me involved with their record. So I, that was the first record I ever engineered properly. Right. And, and, and so yeah. that was engineering for Brad. That was engineering for Brad. Yeah. And I but remember again, I, engineering for an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty wild. Um, and I remember being in the control room and I told Chad and Mitchell, I got it. And they were so happy for me. They were really, really you know, I had been doing some other stuff for some other producers as an engineer, but this was like the first one outside this, this other circle. Yeah. And we did it. I think we cut it in sound factory a, then right. we mixed it in B. So just across the parking lot. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know. Exactly. So, yeah. And then, you know, then I had done a few things for Mitchell. There was a Los Lobos tune on the record afterward called this time that I had tracked over in a, because Chad and Mitchell were doing stuff in B. So um, I would do some fill in work as assisting at that, you know, assisting at that point. Right. I think I'd assisted on a little Cheryl Crow just on one day off, you know, a day here and there, but you know, that dog happened, the, the Los Lobos film happened kind of all around the same time. So it was kind of pulling me out. Right. Right. Real natural progression. Point. I mean, yeah. how you yeah. expect it to go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm not sure how I ended up doing that Joan Osborne record that, you know, and Chad didn't, I, you know, maybe Chad was doing something else at that point, or maybe he had taken off to New Zealand for a while. Cause he would do that every once, you know, just, just go away. Right. And so yeah, whatever the circumstances were, I ended up, you know, doing a few things with Mitchell as well. So, right. Mm -hmm. And then what about, um, cause he did a few records with Tony Berg too. So mm -hmm. we yeah. should, we should talk about that. Cause I mean, one of, one of my favorite things that you did is that Ted Hawkins 
record. Oh, right. Just absolutely yeah. brilliant. But um, we ended you. up, we actually both worked on the Wild Colonials record that Tony did. Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely some overlap there. But you want to yeah. talk about that for a bit? Well, Tony was the guy I was heading out to during the Latin Playboys. Um, we were working up with this artist called Julia Darling at the time. And so I would go out and I would, or was that Ted? That might have been Ted Hawkins at right. the time. Yeah. Can't remember. It, it, it may have been Ted. Um, so yeah, I would drive out there. Ted Hawkins was this, he was this larger than life guy. He was at the time he had to have been in his sixties. He had got, I, I guess he had done a little jail time and gotten into some trouble. He was a budding blues singer and then he got off track, um, ended up singing on third street in Santa Monica. And Michael Penn heard him, told Tony Berg about him, and Tony went down and heard him. He would sit on a milk crate, and he would wear a shoe with a tack in his heel, and he'd have a piece of plywood on the ground. Um, and he would play with a leather glove on his left hand, open tuning. He had these crazy fingernails, glue-on fingernails. One of them came out like two inches on an index finger, and, and his thumbnail curved around. And he would sit on a milk crate, and just howl and wail. It was the most amazing thing. Wow. Um, and so Tony found him and signed him to Geffen. And we did a record. And we would set up Ted in Tony's studio at his house and record just Ted singing until we got a take. And then all the overdubs were done later on. Pat Mastellato played drums, who was in Mr. Mister at the time. And now he's yeah. been in King Crimson for years and years. Um, I don't remember who else played on it. There were a few people that came in and out. Tony did some overdubs on it. And um, yeah, that was actually my favorite recording that I've ever done, I think, is on that record. It's a Creedence cover called Long As I Can See the Light. Yeah. And... Um, we were waiting for Tony to show up that day um, because Ted couldn't play anything in a minor. He couldn't play minor chords with his finger. <laughs> yeah. You know, there, there used to be this, uh, um, this David Allen Greer thing that he used to do um, on in living color or one of those shows where he was the old blues singer, you know, you know, want to hear it, here it goes, that kind of thing. And he'd play this tune. Well, Ted was like the real deal of that. Right. And one day he came in, and he said to Tony, literally, I wrote a song about a Gemini woman and a Scorpio man. It's called Sex Machine. And he <laughs> dove right into it and started playing it. And Tony's like, no, 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 no. But uh, on this particular day, um, we were waiting for Tony to show up. And Ted's out there warming up. And he sounded amazing. And he knew what key the song was in. He knew where to capo it on his guitar. So I said, hey, just strum it put the guitar on a stand, strum it. And when the, when it dies out, just sing the song. And that's what he did. So he tapped his foot, he started singing and then tapped his foot through the entire song, tapped his foot through the solo, <laughs> did, a, did a tacit, a pause, came back in, finished the song. And we did it three times. And after the third take, Tony came in. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, I think you got to hear this. And the first take is what we ended up using. Right, so just acapella because he couldn't have the chords, but he he got the key, and he sang it totally in tune all the way through. And what yeah. did you end up overdubbing on it? Not much, I would assume. Yeah, there's some there's some steel on it, I think, and maybe there's some Patrick Patrick Warren kind of, you know, you know, Chamberlain-y stuff. But but I think there's steel on it. It's really sparse. Um, right. It's beautiful, and and it is. I think it is the best performance I've ever. And it would be the only one he's not playing guitar on. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird because yeah. a lot of people, especially someone who's that intuitive, when you take the guitar out of their hands, they can't sing anymore. Their rhythm yeah. goes to shit, like everything. Exactly. But yeah. No, he was warming up and it was just, it was so good. And he would sing so loud. He would get all of the acoustic guitars in Tony's performance area to resonate. So yeah. every once in a while, you would get this beautiful, you know, hard, loud, and then off you could hear the guitars decaying. Right. It was it was amazing. Yeah. 
And yeah, and that song, I mean, the performance is incredible and the sentiment of the song and, and it's just, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, really amazing. Great. Yeah, people should yeah. definitely check. I can't remember. I don't think he's on. No, that track is on your playlist, isn't it? I'm pretty yeah, sure. I don't know. Well, Marco, remember. Mark is going to put the, the links to the playlists in the in the chat, but definitely if that song's not on there, maybe mm -hmm. Mark could pop a link to that on there. Cause Thank it's, you, Mark. Yeah. It's pretty extraordinary. It's, yeah. I've, it's, yeah. I, I know I've talked about it before in other places, but man, it's just, I still to this day when I hear it, I'm just, I was there. I was there when well, it happened. And so, and to be a geek, how are you mm -hmm. recording them then? Like what, what was the setup? It couldn't have been much, uh, but. U47 on the vocal. Tony had a good sounding U47. Um, an AKG 451 on the guitar. And then I mic'd his foot with a 451. Right. So no room mic, nothing distant, all close. Didn't need it. The The room was super ambient to begin right. with. Even though it wasn't that big, it was really ambient. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so for that track, you just you took all three mics. So the guitar mic was still doing something, but. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. Well, oh, no. No, no, no. I take this back. We recorded all the basic tracks to DAT. Right. So I must have combined the, the, the guitar mic and the click at the same time. Or maybe. Sorry, this is a long time ago. No, no. it's but, I mean, no, This is a good revelation because, yeah, we recorded it to DAT first and then we transferred it to tape. Right, because you, to, you to don't want to be tape. rolling endless reels of two-inch tape for three tracks and you don't know what you're using. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 As a matter of fact, I think I still have all the tracking DATs. From wow. everything we did. Yeah. So yeah, vocal on track one and the guitar was track two. And then probably the click just bled into everything because of the room. Right. So yeah, it was probably just two mics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Incredible. Um, so you had a couple other producers I mean, you worked with at the time. Like, Well, Byron Gallimore was a bit later, right? Yeah. He was probably more late 90s, early 2000s. Late 90s. Yeah. So I mean, mm -hmm. he could wait or not wait. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's we can go mm -hmm. chronologically yeah. or not, but I, I feel like you know we're we're moving moving away from the like you're working with a certain person and getting more mm -hmm. into your own thing. So it starts to make a yeah. little more sense to to go chronologically. But at the same time, mm -hmm. like also at the very beginning of your career, you've got a credit on an Olivia Newton John record. Was this one of your freelance assisting gigs? What was that? Probably, yeah. I yeah. don't even remember. I, it's like whatever. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> it 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 might have been like a guitar overdub or something. You know, I mean, yeah. There there were a lot of like weird one off dates, and right. and you know, I don't, I don't really remember a lot of them. You know, I it, it was just either I wasn't into the music or or it was just a couple of hours and we were done. Right. You know, and then I'm over to somebody else's house or some other thing. You know. Right. No. Right. Okay. So yeah. there's no big story there. No, there's no story behind <laughs> Olivia Newton John. Nope. Nope. All right. Mm -hmm. Well what about um uh hold on. Tave Moti. So Oh man. Yeah. I mean look, I went through the guy's discography, so I can't imagine that the music was something that was like I mean, it was probably not, I, I don't even know what it was he was producing or recording when you were working with him, but. I couldn't tell you either. And it probably wasn't anything that was going to stick with you, but there was, this was getting towards the end of your, your assisting time. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is worth talking about because it, Thanks. it's important. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it up because he, I didn't know him. He showed up to do this two hour overdub. I couldn't tell you anything about it, but I was frustrated that particular day. And I, I don't know what was going on. Some was, you know, some personnel thing or something with the studio or something wasn't cleaned or I was just, you know, I, was, I had kind of had it with assisting at that point too. And, and he saw it. I mean, I, I was pro, I didn't, I didn't vent it towards him or anything, but when we got done, he just said, always leave the place better than you found it. And man, it, it just struck me so heavy. And, and he was so right. And, you know, he had, he had really, he had hair kind of the color of mine, but it was this long kind of, if you've ever met Jim Scott, same thing, like this long yeah. flowing kind of hair. So he had this kind of sage kind of quality to him in a way. And, and, 
yeah, those words stuck with me and he was so right. And man, it, it, you know, I, I mean, I'm not crying now, but I've talked about this and it's brought tears to my eyes before because it was just so profound and it was such a cool thing to leave me with. And, and I never got a chance to thank him because he, he passed away, I think a few years after I had worked right. with him. Ah, but, but man, so true. It's and, true. And, and it's, there's a, you know, the great corollary to that is don't ever let yourself be in a situation that you can't leave better because you know mm -hmm. that going in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin Killen too, man. Great advice. You know, never take a gig just for the money. And the one or two times I ever did, hated them. Hated the band, hated the producer, hated the whole thing. And, and one in particular, I tried to charge my way out of it. <laughs> But they had offered me so much and circumstances at the time, I was just, I'm yeah, going to, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to do this. What, you know, it's a month. What, how bad could it be? Man, I fucking hated it. Yeah. yeah. I've got to say, I've only had a couple of sessions like that in my career, but in some ways they're refreshing because sometimes mm -hmm. you go into something, you think, oh, it's going to be terrible. And it's not terrible, but it's not great, but you can't really complain, whatever. And when it's mm -hmm. like pure evil, and you feel like, yes, I can actually say that was shit. Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of refreshing in a way. <laughs> it's better to not be in the situation, but I'd kind of rather have black and white than just this murky gray the whole well, time. Well, you know, looking back, I just feel like I'm so fortunate. I, I really am, man. I mean, the amount of great things I've been involved with, the amount of like, you know, even just like the business stuff and like getting paid and, and, you know, the stories of people waiting three months to get paid and things like that. Like, I don't have very many of those stories at all. Like I was always, I was always super fortunate, you know, just always found the right people. And, 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 and I've always tried to find something to hang my hat on, you know, with, with people I've worked with, you know, most of the time it's like, what's good about this. And then every once in a while, it's just like, okay, that's definitely not the thing to do. Right. And, you know, and, and, but there's always, and that's attitude really that, that comes down. And that was the big thing about Tave, right? It was, it was reminding me to keep my, kind of my attitude in check and to stay open and stay present because that's where you're going to learn things. And you're always going to learn something if you allow yourself to, right. you know, to just be in the moment. And well, and it's also, it's learning to know what's important too, because I mean, people who don't know Chad or haven't worked with Chad would say, oh, he distorts stuff. Yeah. And that's not what Chad does at all. Mm -hmm. Chad's yeah. I mean whether it's distorted or not as you pointed out earlier some of his mixes are some of the most hi-fi in terms of separation and sound stage and depth and it's brilliant you yeah. know way more hi-fi than anything I'm doing mm -hmm. he just happens to do it with a sans amp because he's a fucker because <laughs> he's so good yeah, exactly <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. um so mixed in with all this there's also an Oingo Boingo credit oh yeah um Farewell Live, um, a really, really cool engineer named Bill Jackson, who was a, another Sunset Sound alumni who I would assist occasionally. He recommended me for that gig. And um, yeah, it was just vocals and guitar fixes. Um, you know, there wasn't a ton of things about that. I don't even know who mixed it, but it was more, you know, it was, there were some serious overdub things that had to happen. And, you know, it's the, the details you remember, the video was off by half a frame. Ugh. and nobody could fix it for a while. And <laughs> I didn't know that much about video at that point. And, you know, so Danny's trying to sing to a video that's off half of a frame. And, and it was, yeah, it got a little frustrating for him at times. <laughs> that, was, that was at Sunset Sound, actually, in Studio One. All right. That was, that was one of the few, at that time, Sunset Sound gigs. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the whole having to synchronize things people are so lucky don't don't be, oh yeah don't be nostalgic for tape man because then if you are then you have to be nostalgic for tape synchronizers yes <laughs> that's true well be nostalgic for tape if you're going to keep it on one machine yeah yeah, yeah. and you're not going to lock anything to it absolutely yep. then feel free <laughs> <laughs> do, do what you want to do yeah. And, and don't, yeah. I mean, I never want to do a vocal comp on tape again in particular. Yep. No, 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 nope. no. There's nope. nothing else to say about that really. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> All right, so what about this Drama Rama record? Oh, man. That was one of the first assisting things I ever did. Really? Yeah. And that was at um, Cornerstone. Yeah, and I think... Yeah, it's like my, my only real recollection of that is is they have a song called Earth Day. <laughs> and Earth Day is on September 22nd. Okay, you know that. And now some well, other I know people that know now. that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, but the lyrics were, it's April 21st, and everybody <laughs> knows today is birthday. Have Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday to us all. And I remember those lyrics, and and every time I, I see Earth Days on the 22nd, I think of this record. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, this is pre-internet, so it's not like yeah. you could look it up. So did, did everyone just assume that that was Earth Day? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't have known any better. Is yeah. Earth Day different where they came from? I don't know. <laughs> they, they grew up in L.A., didn't they? I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah, this is one of those kind of weird, you know, this was 1990. That's funny because the, the credit's from 96, so maybe it got a reissue or something stupid. Maybe, yeah. I mean, you know, again, yeah. the internet. And that that would have been an assistant credit too at that point. Right. And, yeah. Right, yeah, it did mm -hmm. seem to stick out. It was kind of a weird one to yeah, have that's happen funny. there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and right around, so around the, the 96, 97 times, so that's when you mix the That Dog record, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, th so this is sort of the transition into where Mitchell is more on his own and you start to do the stuff with Vonda as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But this is also getting, when we get towards 2000, um, Eros Ramazzotti with mm -hmm. Chelso. Yeah, which I think you... I brought in for that, I yes. believe. Yeah, yes, you I think couldn't do it. You had recommended me to the, the guy who was coordinating it. Yeah. Yeah, and then... And then I did a bunch on it, and then you ended up back on it for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but yes, you ended yep. up working with them for a few records too, right? I did, yeah. Yeah. Chelso, Chelso really liked me, and then Landau and I really got on. Like, I didn't – it's funny. I moved to L.A. partially because of Mike Landau, the guitar player, because I just thought he was, he was one of my heroes coming out of Miami. And I didn't meet him for 10 years. I didn't meet him <laughs> until the late 90s, early 2000s. Did, did and, you know that you were stalking him? Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, he loved Colossal Head. So when he found out we were working together, he knew my name from that record. And it was <laughs> awesome because, like, I wanted to ask him questions about his thing. He's asking me about Los Lobos. And it was brilliant. And, I mean, he's been a great friend ever since. I right. Mean, he's, He's also just a magnificent, you know, musician, guitar player. So, um, but, but yeah, so Chelso, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Sheps. I do have to thank you. Actually, I'm thanking you now for all of the things you've recommended me for over the years. And, and so thank you, well, my friend, very much. Very and, welcome. It's, it never goes badly to recommend you for anything because everybody well, is always very pleased. Well, I thank you. I thank you. Yeah. You've been one of these people who've been very instrumental for me in, in that effect. And, and I hope if I've not reciprocated in that way that I've been able to help you in other ways. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so Chelso, I ended up working with him on this Eros Remizotti. So Chelso Valley was the producer and I loved working with that guy. Um, talk about a, a musician's musician, like, totally trained solfege symbols, the whole syllables, the whole, the whole thing. Like he heard music with a depth that was super impressive to me. Um, we were doing some overdubs at one point and he was just like, Michael, the inversion, the inversion. And all Mike did was he took the low note and put it on top of whatever voicing he was doing. And that record, Andrew went wide. It went deep. It went every dimension possible wow by changing one voice and you know again like ding 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 this is like the mitchell Froom economy stuff it's 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 all of these you know these some of these subtle things that you pick up over the years and man so great and and chelso was so easygoing um he would come in and go today i produce lunch and that's how <laughs> our day would start <laughs> yeah 
And uh, yeah, so I ended up working on a couple of records. And then there was another engineer or another producer who was involved, a guy named uh, Claudio Guideri, who was also, um, he had been doing some songwriting with Eros and he had been kind of moving into more of a production thing. So I'd done some things with him as well in that period. Um, they even flew me to Italy at one point to work. Actually, you and I bumped into each other at Heathrow Airport. Yes, we did. I was coming off an airplane. You were going towards one. You were heading back to the U.S. I was going to Italy. And then we're talking and Bob Clear Mountain walked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was quite the Heathrow experience. Yeah. And it was like a totally dead, like there was nobody else around except the three of us from what I remember. Yeah. It was really yeah. weird. Like, And you're going off to Italy to make the huge fucking record. And I think Bob was mixing the the live Stones film, mm -hmm. and like I was doing something really boring. I was probably just going home or something like that. I had nothing no, going on. No, you were working. You were working with doing? somebody. What was, was it U two at that point? Oh, that might have been coming back from the U two session. All right, well then, all right, that's yeah. a, that's a name dropper too. So yeah, that is three mm -hmm. fucking name dropping motherfuckers. Yep. <laughs> yep. What yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was like the funny random stuff, you know? And, yeah. And, yeah, so they brought me over to Italy at one point to mix a few things, and and yeah, it was great. It was really great. Um, but but a lot of the things that I had done early on, at least with Chelsea, that was like tracking stuff and 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 overdubs, and and the last couple of records I'd worked on, it was almost exclusively with Landau. I was just there working with with Mike. Right. Now, when you talk about that moment with the inversion, it's mm -hmm. the kind of thing where when you hear it you realize the power of that sort of thing but were was that something then you were able to recognize when that was the thing that could change something like did you get to the point after that of realizing like the power of it in a way that you could apply or was it just one of the because for me that stuff is always like oh my god that's amazing but i can never apply it i don't hear deep enough into the music to know now is the time where that's the sort of thing that'll change it. Well, it was one of those things that was definitely a perspective shift. So it made me listen in a different way from kind of that point on. Right. And, and there have been times, even when I'm mixing, you know, there, there's some times where things are bunched up in a way and I might do my own spin on it. I might take that part and just throw an oct like I made you know, some kind of gritty octave thing on it. And then that changes the ratio and, and depending on how loud the octave is to the source, sometimes that changes the ratio enough to create that kind of effect to where it feels like it's kind of changing the dimension on things. Right. And, and so it just made me think about things. Um, yeah. Pitches, you know, in a pitch perspective, as opposed to just treble and bass and, and, right. and EQing perspective, actual arrangement. And do you and, find that it's more within the instrumental arrangement or it's more about the vocal melody that's on top of it? I'm asking know, for myself, really. No, I, <laughs> it's a great question. And I do think it's a combination of both. Right. Because um, when you mute that vocal, sometimes if you, have, if you have instruments playing the same note at the same pitch um, um, or the voicing is the same. I mean, look at, um, I mean, let's look at Back in Black, for example. I mean, look at the bass line on Back in Black. I mean, the second note, you know, instead of what, what are the chords? E, A, and D, right? Second note on the bass is a C sharp. Right. Totally changes the character of the entire record. Yeah. And I can't imagine hearing that song without that, right? So, so that Chelso experience made me think about that voicings, how they relate and then how they relate from one instrument to the other. Cause if, if the guitar players and, and I've done this with some of my production things as well, like um, there's this band, the black mollies that there's a tune that I did where I had the guitar player as an overdub play a part in, in just this fifths and you hear it on its own. It sounds like ding, 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 just in fifths, like a Chinese almost kind of thing but you blend it in with the other tracks and then suddenly the whole thing kind of opens up harmonically a bit more. It only comes in in the chorus and the same guitars are raging through, but yet you get this energy lift that you don't, you know, right. 
unless you're really listening for it, you don't know where it comes from, but you feel that along with the background vocals that come in, it just adds this extra layer. And that was the aha moment for me. And so now I look for, you know, since then, and then as, you know, the production thing has happened more, I look for those kinds of moments to, to lift things in that way. Cause I just think it's really powerful. And then it also keeps things clear and open because that's one of the biggest things, right. That we all run into, you start throwing a bunch of overdubs on and suddenly it starts feeling smaller and smaller and smaller and thicker in some ways. Yeah. How do you get out of that? And, and that's why Chelsea's thing was so big because it really, it gave a whole other, it, it just gave it height. Right. For me. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's also, it, it's realizing that if instruments are going to play the same note, it needs to be because you're trying to get that type of orchestration effect, not because they're just playing the same note. So it's yeah. Ravel instrument stacking thing or play mm -hmm. something else. Yeah. Like get out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think it's, exactly. it's also, it's like, um, and that sort of more of a timbral approach to it when they are doubling all the way back to the Beatles records, all of those guitar parts that are doubled with piano. So they've mm -hmm. got that crazy ringy wood thing that guitars yeah. do not have. Exactly. But you don't hear the piano. Yep. But you absolutely hear the piano. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, yeah. And that's what makes this all still so fascinating to me. You know, even after all this time, there's still so much to learn and and hear in records and and you know and experiment with. Right. It's yeah. Well, let me ask you a question, which has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. But I'm just curious because I've mm -hmm. been thinking about this a lot lately. I used to very speed the tape machine while doing overdubs all the time, mm -hmm. all the time, especially percussion. Like you would mm -hmm. never record a percussion overdub at normal speed because you always wanted it to sound bigger or smaller. <laughs> and you just do it. And it was just it was just part of the day. Like, ah, take the tape up, take the tape up, make those symbols sound big. Mm -hmm. Do you miss that? I do miss the VSO. I do. And one of these days, maybe I'll buy a sync box and be able to do a few things. But it's, the sync you know, only I mean, goes up about a whole step and down, maybe a fourth, I think. Yeah. Maybe it goes a fifth, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, And it's not quite enough. Yeah. No, no. And, and it's funny you're mentioning this, um, you know, for two reasons. Like sometimes it was just a, a practical thing. Like there was a, a Bonnie Raitt tune that I had worked on that I recorded for her. It was a cover of It's All Over Now, Baby Blue that was on a uh, film soundtrack. Pete Thomas played drums on it. And one of his things he played was a coffee cup and as an overdub. And the coffee cup, the pitch of it was like a half step off from the rest of the track. And so I just VSO'd it whatever direction to get it to be in tune. You know, great. So that practical application right there. I'd remember doing something for um, Tom Rothrock at one point. I was actually playing on it. And, but this was using the sync IO where I played a part and then I doubled the part, but I VSO'd it slightly. And I used to love that effect with tape, you know. Yeah. Because it would just change and, the timbre enough. Yeah, just enough and the pitch just enough. Um, but Colossal Head, some of those tunes, we cut them at one pitch and then VSO'd it down until it's like, okay, that feels even better. And then that's where it stayed. Um, that tune, Manny's Bones, in particular, um, that's definitely VSO'd down. So we cut the track and then we may have replaced everything once we got the drums. Right, right. Um, yeah, but that, so that would be one of those examples. And so, yeah, I do miss those kinds of things. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's such a, it's such a production technique that mm -hmm. wasn't fringe, but it's impossible mm -hmm. now in most situations. Yeah. Exactly. So, anyway, yeah. I'm going to start, I'm going to start in the VSO lobby. Um, <laughs> I'm get it back. I'm going to get it exactly. back. Well, so let's, let's talk about, um, Rothrock a little bit because that mm -hmm. was a co-production credit right or am i am i confusing things the particle record what was the deal with the particle oh right um yeah he i don't know how he ended up getting hooked up with them you know he was partners with rob schnapp for a long time and then they whatever happened with them happened and i had been friends with both of those guys for for a long time and i'd assisted them a few times over the years and then tom and i would hang out every once in a while and I called him once 
and say, hey, let's go out to lunch. And he goes, well, why don't you come on down and do some overdubs with me? And this was for this artist, Badly Drawn Boy, who had done a soundtrack for a film about a boy. Yeah. So I had worked on the record, I guess, right after that. And it turned into like two weeks of me doing overdubs and things. So that's kind of where Tom and I had formed this working relationship. And he knew I played and he knew I had ambitions. And he saw how I worked with, you know, with, with Damon, Badly Drawn Boy. Um, so when this particle thing came up, he said, do you want to co-produce it? And I said, okay. And you know, they were this jam band from, I don't remember where. And so, so yeah, so I ended up cutting it and then he was popping in and out. And then we ended up in overdub phases where he would do overdubs and then I would do overdubs and we kind of traded off. And then we were trading off the mixing thing too, which on you know some ways is good and some ways it's just really you know it's like you work really hard to do something you know and i'm sure he felt the same way like and then it gets passed on and then everything you know kind of gets blown out for something else right right and and you know so again a great learning experience in that sense and um and the particle thing you remember, you know, that was one of those records where we kind of did it, we got it done. I think it sat for a while before it actually came out. Right. Um, you know, but in the meantime, we had done Badly Drawn Boy. We did this band called The Stands out right. of England. And um, that was one of those things, too, where it was like we did the mixing and like I would do stuff. I'd walk away. He'd come back in. And, and I this may have been how he and Rob worked as well. I don't really know. I've never really never really asked. And you know, and again, there were a few of those moments where it was just like I did something, loved it, came back, and then suddenly it's just like my big spacious reverb was suddenly gone, and then it's dry, and then the artist comes in and goes, "Oh yeah, I want reverb on it," and then so we kind of get back to it, but it never quite got back, and you know, but but we had a good work, you know, Tom and I had a good working relationship for that period of time, and and you know, that was it was fine, right? And I think yeah. it, it's sonically people would maybe put him sort of in the same camp as Chad, but a totally different approach to, to record making really. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I don't, I, you know, those guys, they kind of made their bones with, um, um, well, first with Beck and then with, um, Elliot Smith. Yeah. You know, so they, I think they, they, they came from a bit of a different place than, than, you know, than Chad, but definitely had an indie streak, no doubt about it. Right. You know, and I think that that kind of showed through, although they also ended up doing some heavier records together. Like there was a band called the toadies and some things like that. Right. Tom, I think gravitated more towards the more singer songwriter stuff. And that may have been one of the reasons why, you know, their divergence, because Rob went on, he did the vines. He did a bunch of more heavier yeah, yeah. Indie rock bands. Right. So, um, but, but yeah, so that was, so we, we'd done a few things at that point, but I had met this really cool guy on the stands record named Howie Payne. He turned me on to Scott Walker. Oh, I right. Know you... I know, I know you are a massive <sighs> fan. I've tried, I I've tried and tried and tried and I just, Man. I can't quite get there. He's like bitter greens for me. And the more it goes, the more eccentric it gets. But man, I, there are just things, especially the first couple of, of, of records, um, where it's just him singing against this orchestra and the arrangements are just so beautiful. And whoever did them is just, you know, they're just brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, funny, funny, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah, your your bitter greens are my, well, my bitter greens. <laughs> I just don't like bitter greens. <laughs> it's just not my thing. Uh, All right, great. what about the Mia Doi Todd record? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's hear a little bit about that. That one was, that was one of those great, um, it was one of those great Mitchell experiences because it's like everything I loved about Mitchell happened during that record. Um, you know, it, it was kind of a, one of those things where it was kind of low budget and he wanted to get it done. And, um, but she was good, but it had to be kind of a simple record. He co-produced it with this with a um, a Sony A and R guy, and he's the one that signed her. 
and he's French, so I'm going to do a poor French accent. And, and the first day he's like, well, Mia, today we are just getting sounds. We're just going to work at your vocal sound. We're going to get used to being in the studio. And he's, you know, he's kind of waxing on and Mitchell's sitting there and he's got his pen and he's just sitting there and, and a pencil. And he's just, he's talking. Mitchell's just back and forth. And we cut like three songs the first day. Of course. <laughs> Mitchell must have known that is not what we're doing today. Like, exactly. yeah, that's what we're doing for the next 20 minutes. And exactly. Then... Exactly. And um, <laughs> and then Jerry Murata played drums on it. And Jerry's, I mean, he's great. Yeah, but and he's hilarious. A, he's hilarious. He's a big presence. He's yep. a big guy, a big energy. And Mia was this very soft-spoken very bright um japanese i think she was of japanese descent if i'm not mistaken really cool really cool person but very quiet very the music's really subdued and jerry is coming in talking about triumph the insult comic dog <laughs> and like going through all of these routines and doing all this crazy stuff and 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 mia you can see her just going like what's going on here it was, it was really funny so Jerry played on this and um, at one point we were doing, we were mixing and we were running into a couple of difficulties um, just with approach and where it should be headed. And um, there were some comments about the vocal sound and this and that, and it got a little tense. And I did something kind of smart ass that in re retrospect, I kind of regret but I called somebody out on something and I probably shouldn't have. And so anyway, so we're getting into mixing and things are a little more tense. And um, so we get to one part of the song and there were a lot of issues, like I said, about the vocal, the vocal sound. It doesn't sound like her and whatever. And it, to me, it sounded like her. It totally sounded like her. So I get to the spot in the bridge and I turn on a, uh, I send the vocal to an MXR flanger <laughs> and it comes on in the bridge for the whole bridge. And at that point, you know, I, I had started this early on. Like I don't want anybody around when I'm mixing until I'm ready. Um, so they respected that. So I told my assistant, I'm like, okay, you have to tell me what happens when this part comes up. <laughs> so I walk out of the room, they come in and they listen and, uh, they made comments and they actually went for it. They had me only do eight bars instead of 16 bars. But when they all left the room, I asked the assistant, okay, what happened? He said, well, um, Mia just leaned into the speakers. The A&R guy, his jaw dropped when he heard it. And Mitchell just laughed. Because <laughs> <laughs> he knew what you were up to. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> but that was a really... That was a super fun record. The low end on it, that was the closest I think I've ever gotten to Chad's kind of low end and separation. It was the only time, I mean, I don't know that I consciously tried. And that was the other thing too. It's like working with Chad and I don't, and you've run into this before too. It's like you work with somebody, you try to incorporate their techniques and then you realize that that ain't me. Yeah. And fortunately I figured it out early on, you know, that, that I am not Chad. But that's probably the closest I've ever come to his kind of low end. And, you know, Davey Farragher played bass on that record and he's playing like a, a Hofner that was really dark. And the first tune in particular, 88 Ways, like that, that's the one for me. That one I really, really, I really like. I think that's the first one on the record. Right. Um, but, um, but yeah, but, but, but that was all the hallmarks of what Chad was doing at the time too, 15 Ips. Dolby SR through right. the API. I mean, it was basically Chad's house and me just kind of coming in and you know, well, you know, doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you painted it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You didn't yeah, just live in his house. No, it's true. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, look, this brings us up to, well, two albums, both from 2003, totally mm -hmm. different. But I think one is The Thrills, which is uh -huh. just sort of a higher profile thing. Mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if you've got anything in particular you want to say about that one, because then we got to get into something else. So Okay. Well, The Thrills was one of those records I alluded to earlier. Right. Yeah. Okay, we, we yeah. could leave it at that. 
Well, let's just leave it at that. Did yeah. it for the money. Okay, so look, but here's <laughs> one that is the complete opposite of that that came out the same year, which is the Soraya record. Oh, right. Mm hmm. Yeah. So let's hear about that because the first thing is I love how this ties back into the Miami crowd. Yeah. And then also sort of where it went and how well it did and what it, it meant to everybody who was involved in it too. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, thank you. And, and that's a brilliant segue. And this is why you're, this is why you're great at this, Mr. Sheps. <laughs> I just sit here uh, and say stuff. Oh, come on. Um, yeah, our friends from Miami, Lee Levin, Dan Warner, um, they were talking with Soraya. She um, she was looking for somebody to engineer her record. Um, she had come off two years of breast cancer treatment, and this was kind of her comeback record. And she was and pretty she, big already, right? She had done very well in um, yeah in Latin America. She had done a few records. She was married by married. She was managed by by Miles Copeland, right? She'd done a sting tour in the U.S. Like she was kind of poised to kind of get into this next step. And then she got sick. Um, so she had signed a deal with Sony Latin America. And this, like I said, was her record that was really all about her experience. And so Dan and Lee recommended me. And it was totally up my alley. It was totally um, something that I was excited to do. It was a big uh, kind of transition for me at that point as well. I was, um, you know, with personal life stuff and just kind of moving into a new phase. And, and so they brought me down to Miami to do it, you know, ship my gear down and the whole thing. That was the first time I'd ever had that happen. And um, we recorded a criteria. Um, and the spirit around that record was so good. Um, it was Dan and Lee and um, a guitar player named David Cabrera. There was Soraya. Um, Wendy Peterson was one of the background singers on it. I don't know if you remember her from school. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and then um, and I, the bass player was a guy named Julio Hernandez, I believe. But really good band. Um, and... But the songs, that was really it. And it was all in Spanish, but she would talk to me about what they were about and what she was going for. And, and the whole camaraderie around the whole thing was just beautiful. And was she self-producing or was there another producer as well? She was self-producing. Right. And, um, and then a guy named Doug Emery was involved as well. I don't know if you knew him mm -hmm. as well. Uh, he may have come in the year you left kind of a thing. Right. And, um, but anyway... So she ended up doing the vocals down there and then she came to LA and mixed, uh, we mixed in sound factory at studio B. Right. And, um, yeah, so that was in 2000, must've been 2002 and then right. 2003, the record came out and then, and she won a Grammy for it. Yeah. She won the best singer songwriter Grammy of, you know, for 2003, I think, you know, we got it in 2004. And, um, yeah, and I got it in the best way possible. Like somebody, Sebastian Chris, I believe. I don't know if you know Sebastian. Yeah. He's a yeah, yeah, really great guy, really great dude. Yeah. He pointed out the fact that it was a singer-songwriter album award. And because it's an album award, the production people should get them as well. So I had been going through this period in my life where my mom had died, um, I was moving into a new house. Like it was all this upheaval in my life. And then I found out I got this thing and I got it in the best way possible. I didn't stress over it. I didn't go to the awards. I didn't worry. Am I going to win this thing or not? It right. just you showed didn't up in the mail. For it. Yeah. Right. It just showed up in the mail like that September after all of this turmoil. And I swear after that thing showed up, my life really kind of just mellowed out for right. a bit. It was really... It was just a really interesting time. The songs were beautiful. Um, it was a really fun record to do. Dan and Lee sounded amazing on it. And yeah. Yeah, Dan and then, really, I mean, it's you can't overstate what an incredible musician and a beautiful guy he was too. Oh man, no, he was incredible. And um, yeah, for those who don't know, Dan passed away a little over a year ago. Yeah. Um, and you and I were both involved with him on a project when yeah. it happened and I had spoken to him just a few days before. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, he was probably probably the best acoustic guitar player on record I think I've ever heard. Yeah, and um, effortless. Just, effortless. Yeah. The tone, everything about it was great. Tone, feel, tone, the whole thing, and and fast, and he was just great. He was just really a great musician. Right. And so dude, it's fantastic to have a record yeah. where you love the people involved, you love the music involved, you love the experience of making the record, and then it actually translates into something that gets out into the world and other people love it. Yeah. Because that's, yeah. you know, to get that combination doesn't happen a lot. No, no, definitely not. And and it's it was very, very fulfilling on so many levels, you know. And then, you know, then unfortunately, a few years later, she did one other record and then she passed away. She died at like age 35. Right, secondary cancer. Yeah. 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 And so it was really, yeah, it was a very, um, yeah, it was a very illuminating experience on so many levels. And, and she was... She was really sweet on top of it, like really great, thankful, you know, really gracious and and appreciative of everything that that had happened. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I love that one. Definitely. And how was it working at Criteria? I'm only asking because like while we were at school, that was like the you know, that's that was like the one big boy place around that. I mean, I got to go once mm -hmm. to see a session and then I think I worked on well, one of the oddest sessions I ever did was there like for a day or something and uh -huh. that's it. But so how was that going back to Miami to make a record? Did it feel anything like that? I mean, you'd spent more time in South Florida, but. It was my first time in South Florida since 1996 or 97. Wow. Cause my parents, my parents had moved away around then and I had no reason to go back, even though I grew up in Pembroke Pines. Um, so. So yeah, it was kind of weird being back there on one hand. Criteria, the whole thing was a weird experience because... Was this before the Germanos took it over? It was after. It was so after, the okay. $7 million renovation. Yeah. And I had to put up packing blankets behind the speakers in the control room to get rid of this weird lower mid thing that just, just sounded weird. There was no imaging, no definition. So I had to put packing blankets on music stands or, or, or on mic stands. Um, I had an assistant who kept trying to tell me what to do. I'm like, I want this patch this way. Well, no, that's not how it works. Well, that's how it's going to work now. So I fired him the first day. Um, you know, used the KM86, which is a side address microphone. He had pointed it at the top at all the instruments that I wanted to use it on, that kind of a thing. There were all these beautiful photos of the old criteria. Yeah. And I, I yearned for that room because the performance area was huge and cavernous and, and, you know, but I made it work. But it was the funniest thing I remember, though, is I got out of there two in the morning one day and think, you know, it's like you're bleary eyed after a full day. You go to go home and you open the door and I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm in Florida. <laughs> and I'm looking around. I had a drive to Dan Warner's that night to get because I was sleeping with either at Lee's house or, or Dan's trying to help them with the budget. And, you know, so I drive all the way back to Dan's. He's supposed to have a hide a key and the key's not out there. And it's <laughs> pissing down rain at like two 30 in the morning. I had to call him and wake him up. It was just, <laughs> well, that's what he gets, you know, <laughs> it was just one of those days, but it was, that record was really, that record meant a lot to me on so many levels. Yeah. Right. Yep. Excellent. Yep. And then not yep. long after, you you alluded to this record before, but we should talk about it um, on its own, is the Black Molly's record mm -hmm. you produced too. Yeah, my friend um, my friend Wade uh, from Chandler Limited. Right. He he and Tori at the time were really close. Tori, uh, the main the main force of the Black Molly's wanted to um you know, wanted to do a record. Wade recommended me. He had somebody financing it. Um we recruited you to help out with one portion of one song and and I am apologizing you now publicly. I don't think we credited you for it. So I'm no, very, but very sorry. I was trying to remember. So what was the deal? What what, what did I I don't even remember what happened there. There's one bar where it VSOs, tape VSOs down. I didn't have the Pro Tools plug in to do it and you did. <laughs> and 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 you know, and and 
So everybody kind of understands my relationship with Andrew. Like we've been friends for a long time, but Andrew is the smartest guy I know, especially when it comes to technology and, and with Pro Tools and everything else. I would beat myself up for two days before I would call Andrew to ask him a question because I know he was the guy who would get inundated with this stuff like crazy. Um, and, you know, and I would finally have to capitulate because I couldn't figure it out. I would call Andrew and within 10 seconds, oh, it's this. <laughs> and I was like, fuck. I would get so upset, A, because I didn't figure it out, and B, because I bugged you about it, but I, I you were the resource, and I know you were that way for a million people, so that's yeah. I'm well, Debbie you used to actually make too. fun of all the phone conversations I had that were nothing but numbers and letters. It was all acronyms <laughs> and pieces of gear, and, uh, and so she'd get off, I'd get oh, off the phone, man. and she'd say, well, did, did you ask him to try the TS-14? Like, <laughs> no. This does a job. Awesome. So okay, so I audio so sweeted great. some audio sp- sweeted, yeah, like like tape stuff. The drum tracks and yeah. That's fine. I don't yeah, need that's it. about how long as it went. But, all right. but that, that's um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> but that record we cut at Sound City. It was super fun to do. Um yeah, unfortunately it shipped plywood. That's a that's a joke Joe and I, Joe Barisi and I share and we've had yeah. for a long time. But but it was a great experience, man. I had so much fun doing it. I saw the Sound City ghost while I was working there. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was good. It was really good. And did you get to work there more than that? Or was that kind of it? I worked there a few times. I did um I did a thing with Tony Berg there a little bit with this Julia Darling girl that right. that, that we had worked on. Um I did there were a few things over the years, but I did the very last session as oh, right. Sound City. Um, I was working for Yamaha Guitars. They were doing these things where they were recording acoustic guitars and then doing... Um, oh, right, the modeling stuff. The modeling right? thing, yeah. exactly. So they always wanted to do it on Neve consoles. And as I was driving to the studio that day, I was getting people calling me up saying, yeah, you know, um, you know, bring the flag with you or have fun and all this other stuff. Cause I hadn't heard they were closing down and I got there and that was the day yeah, that I'd heard. So I did the very last session at sound city wow. on that console before Dave Grohl bought it and took it. That's amazing. No. Yeah. yeah. It's wild. Yeah. And I don't think people it's, it's hard to describe what that place was like because it was by far one of the best sounding live rooms on the planet mm-hmm. with one of the best sounding consoles on the planet but it was a total shithole in one of the worst parts of that part of LA. Yeah. I mean, it was, it really it was funky. Was. Yeah. But it, it was, was amazing. Yep. You know, did you get to work there a lot? Not Have a lot, but yeah. I mean, I did many sessions there. I mean, not like Joe yeah. or, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't live yeah, there. Yeah, like Joe. But, Joe lived there, right? Exactly. Yeah. But no, yeah. I did. I did quite a few sessions there. And mm-hmm. it was, um, I mean, I think I'm the only person who ever struggled to get a drum sound in there. I had one session where it's like I couldn't get a drum sound. I don't know what oh, the hell was going on. No. And it was oh, with, man. it was with, um, was it Chad Wagerman or was it his brother? I can't even remember. Brooks. It was one of the, I mean, it was like, it should have been put any microphone in the room. <laughs> and it was just an absolute nightmare. But I also had, you know, some of the best sessions of my life in there. Yeah, and that's the way I feel about it too. I mean, I, the Black Molly's record though, I when I mixed it, it was dull. Like I had a, I had a boost 4 dB a 10K shelve through these quad eight EQs I have. I don't know how I ended up that dark with it, but that's what I ended up doing just to get it to go. Right. But no, Sound City, that performance area, you push up those faders, that was it. You were done. It's yeah. like you didn't really, um, you know, but yeah, it was funky. It was weird. And there was, you know, not to get back on the ghost thing, but you would walk into certain parts of that building. I mean, that, that, um, that lounge in the back off Studio A was always freezing cold. The bathroom in that hallway yeah. was always creepy always <laughs> yeah yeah really wild yeah it's a funny place and then the cat rewind would like get near the plates and you'd hear him like <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah a very very funny studio and yeah. also has a great cameo in um oh what's the movie boogie We're, nights yeah and boogie nights yeah mm-hmm. yeah yep 
Yep. Anyway, enough about that. Yeah. Well, so look, this brings us up to something we alluded to earlier, which is sort of the, the Byron Gallimore era and uh-huh. did, yeah. and also which leads us into Robbie Williams, I think, a little bit. But you want to talk okay. about some of the stuff you did with Byron and then get into the Robbie Williams thing? Yeah, Byron was a total recommendation from Mike Landau. And um, he wanted something a little different. So he came to L.A. and we cut... Um, and for Mike those people who bit- don't know, he was a pretty successful Nashville producer. Yeah, Tim McGraw, Faith Hill. Yeah, um, so by pretty successful, I mean ones. like holy shit successful, basically. Yeah, like I think he did Breathe. I'm pretty sure he's I the one that so. did Breathe. Um, so... So he came to he came to L.A. Mike put the band together. It was Pete Thomas on drums, Mike Elizondo on bass, Jeff Babco on keyboards Fuck and no. Mike and Val McCallum on guitar. Mike played electric, Val played acoustic. And we cut probably half this particular record. There was a song called Telluride on it. I don't re- the record was called Set This Circus Down. And Byron co-produced it with a guy named James Stroud, um, who was a big wig at DreamWorks records nashville when that was happening james also produced a little song called mr big stuff by (laughs) gene mcknight was that her name and i don't know but that was a big yeah you know that tune right yeah yeah yeah. so uh so we cut it at sony music studios byron let me cut it to tape and this This is is sony in la where sony in la was on colorado and 20th yeah i don't think i ever actually got there but i heard i love that place it It was a vincent van hoff room 8078 um nice amount of outboard gear everything worked really well maintained by a guy named pete barker um and you know but this is one of those context things right it's just like okay i'm thinking nashville and nashville records they have to be bright He's letting me cut it to tape, but man, I got a, so I'm putting on top end, like as far as I'm concerned, it's like nobody's business. Um, so we cut the tracks. He loves them. Everybody's happy. They take it back to Nashville. They transfer it to 3348. And I get a call from Byron. He's like, now, John, he goes, I got to say, I really love these tracks. He goes, they're really buttery. He goes, they're a little darker than I'm used to, but <laughs> it's like, oh shit, you know? <laughs> And like, there we go. Everything's relative. But every time Byron came to L.A. then for the next couple of years to do overdubs with Landau, I got called. So it was great. I'm working on these tunes with a producer who's a great hang. Byron's just a lovely guy. Landau's brilliant. And so I'm sitting there and I'm cutting Landau guitar solos and he's sitting right next to me. And and we're like having a laugh as we're doing it. Um there's one tune where he kind of does this thing where he goes into Van Halen for a little bit and it ends up on the record at the very, very end. We both never expected it to happen. And at the very end of this song, it's still there. Um, and, um, and then Byron flew me to Nashville at one point and I cut a bunch of sides for this guy named Phil Vassar. And then we did a bunch of tunes for somebody else. And it was great because I had like 11 people playing at the same time. It was Ocean Way, Nashville. You know, we cut three songs a day. Right. Like clockwork, you know, from soup to nuts. Like nobody had heard the tune. Brent Mason was on it. Um, a couple of other really Lonnie Lonnie Smith. Is that the pedal steel guy? I can't remember, but really, really great band. And yeah, and Byron was always fun. He always had nicknames for some for people. He called me Patty. Patty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey patty because <laughs> you were more irish than anyone else in the room or <laughs> i guess so or maybe i'd mentioned i was half irish at some point i don't i don't remember but that was byron he's always you know nicknames that's somebody. great i mean and that's living the dream that's like yeah, yeah that's yeah man the and, point. and at one point yeah it's like i fly to nashville i do this stuff i fly back and the day i fly back i'm on my way to sony to cut strings for like an ally mcbeal thing at that point so they were like 20 people out there you know and yeah i mean I, how could you not miss those kinds of experiences you know it was great man you had all the stuff going on there were things coming up and and yeah that was like the beginning that was right right before all the things really started to change that was before right yeah and that was right around the what robbie williams thing yeah right. yeah and that did lead kind of into that whole experience well yeah. do go on and here we are <laughs> So it must have been sometime 2000, 
2001, um, one of my closest friends is a drummer named Jeremy Stacy, who I had met years ago and done a few records with him. Well, I wanted to ask like how you how you met him because I know you've known him for a really long time. But so how how did you meet him? Because pe people should know Jeremy Stacy. He's so we've already mentioned one of the drummers in King Crimson. He's mm -hmm. another drummer in King Crimson. There's exactly. still another one, but. Mm -hmm. Jeremy's also the primary keyboard player in King Crimson yes. as well. I mean, he's a brilliant musician, really yeah. great, beautiful feel. He um, he had been in a band called The Lemon Trees. He had opened for maybe Suzanne Vega or something when Mitchell was still working with Suzanne. And Mitchell had been on the tour. They met, became friends, exchanged numbers. So Jeremy ends up in L.A. working on some record for some woman he had met at a party. She was half Japanese and her boyfriend was financing this record, like paying cash, the whole thing. Um, so Jeremy wrote a whole bunch of songs, came to LA, needed an engineer. Mitchell suggested me and Jeremy and I, we hit it off and we'd become friends and we'd worked on things off and on over the years. And every time he's come to LA, it's like I've basically seen him every time since probably 1995 or whenever that was that we right. met. So, um, so Jeremy invited me down to Conway when he had been in LA working on a Robbie Williams record. Um, it's the one where he's hanging upside down, Escapology it's called. And so I had met the producer, the engineer. Uh, producer was a guy named Guy Chambers. The engineer was Steve Power and the A&R guy, a guy named Chris Briggs, who I just love. Chris signed Def Leppard. He's been like, he's, he's just a great dude. Um, so they needed an engineer to record one song for the record because um, they were running behind. So they hired me and I did it at O. Henry in Burbank. Right. And it was a duet with Rose Stone. Steve Ferroni played drums. Wadi Watel played guitar. Wow. I don't remember who played. It might have been Leland Sklar playing bass. I mean, it was a great band. And so that was my first introduction to that whole camp. And so we cut this tune. Um, and that we cut it on September 11th, 2002. Right. I remember the date because um, Robbie made a little speech before we got going. And then I didn't hear from Chris for a while. Um, I ended up working on a record with this Irish woman named Gemma Hayes. And... Um, he had called Briggs was the a and guy and he had called to talk to the producer, um, found out I was there and I got on the phone with him and, and we talked for like 20 minutes and it was, it was really great to catch up with them. I ended up getting, it's the only record I was never asked back on was the Gemma Hayes record. I was told that she didn't want me. Wow. And yeah which I found out later was not true. Um, but it opened up, it opened up um, an opportunity um, because this happened like in like November of whatever year that was. And in January, I got a call from Chris Briggs saying, Hey, I have a gig. You're probably overqualified for it, but would you be interested? Uh, Robbie is working with a producer named um, Stephen Duffy. And Steven needs some help. They've been recording this record for two years and we got to get this record done. And he needs somebody to help him go through Pro Tools. Would you meet with them? I'm like, great. So we met at Kings Road Cafe and Steven is like white as a ghost because he's just exhausted from these two years. And he's a very talented singer songwriter. He had success on his own. I think he wrote some songs for Bare Naked Ladies or a few of those bands in the nineties, or they recorded a few of his songs. And um, so uh, that's how I got into it. Steven liked me and I ended up going through all of these Pro Tools sessions, figuring out what to keep, what not. We went through them together. And then we recorded drums. Matt Chamberlain played on it, um, brought in a bass player. Um, yeah. And then suddenly like the record company took it seriously after the first set of rough mixes went out because then I started getting phone calls. Make sure you put the drives in the vault every night. Make sure they're right. And I had no idea how big Robbie Williams was either. I was just, you know, I clueless. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think he was nearly as big in the States. No, no right? way. It close. was all UK at yeah. that point. Yeah. Well, in yeah. Europe, probably. But yeah. Well, now, yeah. just really quickly on the Gemma mm-hmm. Hayes thing, do you mm-hmm. think it was because the producer saw you have a really chummy conversation with the AR guy who'd called him to possibly tell him bad things? Um, no, I, I think I it was... I just want to speculate and get people in trouble, that's all. I'm just stirring up shit. No, I think it was... I loved Gemma Hayes. Like, I thought she was great. Like, I loved the songs, and I... I took some initiative. Like, I was able to write charts for songs, so I did, because I thought it was important to move the session along. And I, I don't think I don't think those approaches were appreciated. Right. It was also a different headspace as far as the production and how it was coming together than I was used to or normally like to work. Um, so yeah, I just I just wasn't asked back, but the way right. I was told was lame. Right. And yeah, and and but it's fine. It's really fine. I mean, her record, it did what it did. The one song that I loved, I think my drum tracks, I think the basic tracks that I cut, I think those are still there. And and I still love this song. I, I you know. Right, and right. So it, it wasn't for lack of trying or wanting to be involved. No, I, no, I no, thought just, she was just, great, you know. Just curious because yeah, no, it's, stick it's in my fine. Head. But anyway, so back no, to Robbie. No. So back to Robbie. Which um, which I love, like the fact that that the way they describe the position as oh you might be overqualified for it but it i mean it ends up where you're almost co-producing to help figure out what these arrangements need to be i mean it's a it, it's, yeah you can't be overqualified for that role yeah it's not yeah. a pro tools operator gig no it wasn't it was literally what do you think of this part and how this works into this and then it would be like yes or no well what if it's this and it was great it's beautifully it was collaborative Stephen was very gracious and 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 took care of me, you know, in in that way, which was fantastic. I played guitar on two songs on the record. Um, you know, I I loved it. And then Matt Chamberlain played on it. We did it at Henson, and and it was just super fun. And then on top of it, you know, they flew me to England. That was the first time I had flown that far for work. Right. And um Robbie was playing some underground um, bicycle arena in East Berlin <laughs> called the Velodrome. And they, they were broadcasting this performance to movie theaters all over the world. And it's 15,000 people in there. Um, the only people who knew the record were me and Steven. And Steven was on stage because he was the musical director. So I sat in the truck and basically talked through the whole thing. And, and then I had to mix that entire show for rebroadcast a few days later in England. Right. So I went right to air studios after that and spent, you know, however many days in that little SSL room in the middle studio B, I guess it is. Yeah. Or C or, um, or is it three? It might be. Yeah. I don't remember if they're numbered or lettered. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I basically blasted through that whole thing. Wow. And your assistant at Air was was Adam. Adam, exactly. Who you then recommended to me? Yeah. And I used him every time I could until now. He's so big that you know. I know he's he's become he's become huge. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. He was, he is awesome. He even helped you out. Actually, that was the U two thing. Yes. He even helped you out with U two because because the second time I went back to England to work on another live thing was when we had overlapped there because I went to visit you at Rack. Right. Uh, Well, no, I was at SARM probably. Oh, SARM. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I I brought Adam in because we just, this is Adam Noble, uh, Scottish Mm -hmm. engineer, producer, just amazing, amazing talent. Uh, And great dude on top of it all. Really great hang. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, and we just, we needed more hands. Like, it was so full on. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And Adam came in and just, as he, mm-hmm. as only Adam can do, he just didn't sleep, you know, for days. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was the trip where I met George Martin, which was brilliant. 
So let's hear about that. Because, I mean, the guy is obviously, like, top of your list. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not, not like one and one A. He's number one and number two and number three, probably. Yeah, no. So it, it was, let's let's hear the story of you you meeting him because it, it was incredible. He, um, I had been told he had been in and out and around, um, and I of course I said I would love to meet him. And they're like, okay, well we'll see if he's up for coming in. And and this second trip, I don't know what it was, but I was there like four. I worked like fourteen days straight, and I was on day fifteen, so I was exhausted, and I was in the. Um, in the Neve room at that point. And um, they had this incredible tracking room. I mean, have you worked in that room? There? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty insane. I It's the best purpose-built studio I've ever been in. I mean, I've never been in a studio where the drummer's playing in the other room and you hear absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm in there and I'm doing something and I look up and in walks George Martin just by himself looking as no pun intended on my name, but as a paternal figure, as you could ever imagine. He just, it's just like this halo that came in <laughs> and he introduces himself and I stand up and we stand there and we talk for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And we're talking about LA and studios and where he liked. And he was asking me how I liked air. And then I open my big mouth and say how big of a fan I am. And and immediately then it just he sort of retreated yeah yeah yep. again like huge learning experience but you know it mm -hmm. how do you not say it look i yeah. i when i i was fortunate enough to meet him um the first time i ever met him was it was backstage at the first traveling wilburys show that ever happened they were playing in in london wow. And I'd been doing a lot of, uh, I was still fixing Synclaviers at that point. Mm -hmm. So I knew Mark Knopfler and all of his team. And so he, through this guy, Ron Eve, lovely, lovely guy who worked with Mark, he got me in to see the show. I had a friend with me um, who was visiting from LA. We went mm -hmm. to the show and we go backstage. It's like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And of course, everybody's there. And mm -hmm. Sir George is there. Was he, I don't even think he was Sir at that point. That came a bit late, didn't it? I believe it did, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, we're both thinking, like, you know, bah, we got to go mm -hmm. talk to them. And so the guy, this not me, but the guy I was with, went up to him, and it made perfect sense to him when he said he was introduced, got to shake his hand, and all he could say was, you're the reason I never get any sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, all he meant was, you are the inspiration for my career. Mm -hmm. The only reason I make records is because of the way you make records. And it was this very profound thing. But that, yeah. that's, those are the <laughs> words the that way came, it came out. out. <laughs> and George is still holding the hand, and the handshake sort of stopped. And that was the mm. end of that conversation. No, <laughs> it, was like, man. it was a shame, but it was still, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, he's a legend. But you met, him, you met him a few times then, it sounds like. Well, yeah. I mean, I sort of ran into him at air a couple of times. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, people obviously associate him with Abbey Road because he was mm -hmm. staff at EMI when it wasn't even called Abbey Road at that point. But exactly. he helped found air. I mean, that's his mm -hmm. place. And so he yeah. had offices in Oxford Circus when it was there. And then he had offices once it moved. And yep. so he's very, mm -hmm. very involved at air. So, yeah, he was there a couple of times. I mean, I don't think... I ever had a meaningful conversation with him. I've mm -hmm. talked more to Giles than I ever did to to George. But yeah, but mm -hmm. you can't help but be an idiot around the guy. Yeah, yeah. I I, I was surprised I lasted as long as I did. But <laughs> but man, he was so lovely. And you know, and the other thing I was told is he's he's kind of hard of hearing at this point. So make sure you project. And and yeah, I had no problems with him at all. And it was great. It was it's so always great. good to get advice, for people like that. Like I had to go. No, I, sorry, this is your show, but it's no, just no, me I, no. This it, is us talking. I love this. Just, I love that you're getting to share. Well, like I, Pete Townsend also had a Synclavier, and I had to go to the studio to fix. It. And I'd been a few times mm -hmm. to fix it, and he had this great uh, engineer, Jules, who would meet me out there, and she was awesome. But then there was one time where he was going to be there because I was doing lots of MIDI programming as well. Like HyperCard on the Mac could do MIDI. <laughs> and so I don't even, it was like I was doing program change stuff for synths or some geeky thing, whatever it was. And ladies and gentlemen, this is why Andrew Sheps is the smartest person. No, but, but what Jules told me was, look, mm -hmm. if you go out there, make sure you're in a chair that swivels. That's all I'm going to say. And you're like, 
what? <laughs> like, all right, whatever. So I go in and I sit in the studio. And the reason is because Pete paces constantly and almost like in a Monty Python way, like you can't keep up with him. And he'll mm -hmm. walk up onto the couch and off the back of the couch and around the back of the console. And so I was in my swivel chair. So it's like people like this, mm -hmm. you need the advice. Of course. And then you can't yeah. follow it anyway. Yeah. Because it's just, yep. it's too much. It's too big mm -hmm. of a, a moment. Oh man, how cool was that? Yeah. That must have been amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so back to Robbie Williams. Mm-hmm. And back to John Paterno, more importantly. Oh. Yes. Well, I don't know. I mean, well, does no, this finish the, the Robbie I, story? Yeah. Or? So I ended up, yeah, well, I ended up doing those couple of things um, in England. Then I mixed a, a best of live DVD. And I was mixing it at home at that point in my little room and sending them mp3s and then when they would approve everything then i went to henson and did the surround mixes at henson and just split everything out put the audience in the rear maybe a couple of other things and and printed them all out and then that became a, a pretty big selling i think it sold like seven hundred thousand copies or something right which for dvd is huge yeah 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 and then you know i'd done some stuff up at his house I put a studio in Robbie's house at one point, bought the furniture, spec the gear, put the stuff in, you know, so I was involved with them for a little bit longer. And then suddenly that was kind of it. You right. know, he and Steven stopped working together. Steven and I still work together. I've done two records with them and he's talking about a third. Right. Um, they've been really fun. His lilac time, which is kind of a folk thing. And right. Right. No, so, but he's good. He's smart. He's really very British, very funny, very very dry and a brilliant vocabulary so you know yeah you gotta love people who actually went to school i suppose yep. yeah yep definitely all right look i want to talk about somebody who you've done a couple records with who's i mean he's people know who he is but i think he's he's more important than he gets credit for and that's roger manning mm -hmm. yeah so yep. let's let's talk up roger manning for a little bit let's let's do that um I can't explain remember. who he is first because well roger manning um is well, he's a fantastic keyboard player known for his synth work as much as anything else he's um yeah. he was in a band called jellyfish as yeah. well and yeah. that that's kind of where he broke into things um he uh he also sings he's a songwriter singer arranger he also had a band uh, a, a duo with a guy named brian kiu if you don't know brian's name he's a he's a brilliant um historian a, a super smart guy he does a lot of uh compilations restorations things like that anyway they they had a band called the moog cookbook and they did all of these really funny covers using synthesizers of all these you know eagle songs and all these other pop tunes so um I don't remember how Roger and I were introduced, but I ended up mixing like four records for him, I think, yeah. over the years. And he does these really funny, quirky, um, but very beautifully done records. Um, very intricate. He's very particular. And they all nod at a lot of his favorite musical influences. Yeah. So all really good. Yeah, yeah, super, super talented. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, there is so much going on with Jellyfish that sometimes he may get, I mean, maybe he doesn't get overlooked, but it feels like he sometimes doesn't get quite the, the credit. For that. Yeah, I versus, mean, obviously, Andy. that's mm -hmm. a gigantic part of, of the way those records are. Yeah. You know. Yeah, definitely. So, definitely. Super, yeah. super talented. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to skip over some, because I want to talk, there are, three, there are three records I want to talk about, well, four, no, there's more than that, okay. and we're coming up on the three hour mark, and I don't want to wear everybody out, so okay. let's, let's talk about, um, well, let's talk about Steve Gadd, for fuck's sake. Okay. Come All on. Right. Let's. Steve let's. Gadd. Yep. Mike Landau, again. Yep. Hey, man, I'm playing with Steve Gadd, and Steve Gadd. Basically, the Steve Gadd band is James Taylor's backup band. And so it's Jimmy Johnson on bass. At the time, it was um, Walt Fowler on trumpet, Larry Golding's on keyboards, and Landau. 
um, along all the just magical musicians, just brilliant, brilliant musicians. Um, so Mike asked me to do it and we did it at Mike's house. Mike's got an API console, um, pro tools rig, and I've done things with Mike at his house before. So we cut the record in a few days. Um, a couple of the tunes weren't even written. Um, the record, nobody ever said, okay, we're ready to record and counted it off. It was more like, okay, it feels like they're about ready to do a take and I would put Pro Tools in a record. And nobody ever questioned it. Nobody ever said, oh, wow. And this all goes back to that thing of just kind of paying attention and being present, you know? And, and the one time I missed it, I was two bars late on one tune and they did a huge vamp going up before the song that the head started so i just faded that song up and that's why the song fades up right. on the record that did way you t did they know it's because you didn't have the front or did you just present it that way well they 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 knew <laughs> okay. I, I said i missed yeah. the first couple of bars i said but i think we can do this so i had already discovered the solution before they had even come in right so. right right um but yeah it was it was super fun and and you know hearing gad play it was the first time i had worked with or met gad right and um and my first conversation with him was kind of funny too, because, um, you know, he's got such a thick Rochester, New York accent. And so that was the first thing I talked about with him. And I almost feel like it was kind of refreshing. It's just not like, Oh, the great drummer and talking about all this stuff. I'm like, yeah. wow, man, we're, you know, you know, you sound like you're from Rochester and then, and you know, or upstate New York. So that was our first thing. And then he's half Italian like I am. And so there was this whole, it was a whole nice little thing that didn't have to do with, you know, Steely Dan, Steely Dan. And yeah. And, yeah and the hustle and whatever else he'd played on 50 ways to <laughs> leave hustle. your lover. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So it was, it was a fun record to record. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and they'd written a couple of tunes on the spot, which is always another like really fun thing to be involved in. And, you know, minimal overdubs and just making a few changes in between songs as they're working up ideas. I'm going out and moving microphones and, and, you know, yeah, really, really fun. Right. Great. Yeah. Well, and another legend along that route is Robin Ford. So, right. Yeah. So I had done, uh, my friend, I think my friend Toss Panos got me involved with that. Who's a great drummer. He plays on that that Robin Ford live that I did um, soul on 10. I think that record's called. And most of that record is from one night. Right. Um, I didn't record it, but, um, but I mixed it, you know, back at my little place. And um, that one was super fun as well. Robin was playing really well. Um, and yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't, you know, that was just one of those things that, you know, I don't think there was like anything monumental that kind of came out of it. Right. But, but yeah, but it was, it was fun to do. And, and I, you know, I like doing band instrumental records and, and, you know, jazz or jazz adjacent things, you know, it's <laughs> jazz it's, adjacent. I mean, I, you know, oh, I mean, butts it's jazz. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, would you call the Steve Gadd record jazz? I mean, maybe you would, maybe you would. Yeah. Wouldn't. But I mean, you know, and, yeah, yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean. I just, yeah. it's a funny way to put it. <laughs> it butts jazz. I even like that better. <laughs> it's a jazz abutment. Yeah. <laughs> or abutment, abutment. All right. Well, look, you... another record that I don't think you had a huge role in, but we have to talk about. Okay. Because it's a super important record is the Derek mm -hmm. Smalls record. <laughs> oh right of course of course again toss panos see now we're, we're in the toss theme there you go um we recorded those drums at toss's house and um yeah and and harry showed up and um yeah it was just it was an afternoon of of like cracking up at lyrics and and toss learning the arrangement and and CJ, and was CJ there at the same time. Yeah, yeah CJ yeah. was there as well. So there's always a lot of stories with CJ around as well, and a lot of you know really cool things to be gleaned. And but that was yeah, yeah, that one was pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was recent too. That was just within the last few years. I yeah, think. yeah. I mean that yeah. I remember talking to CJ about that record. Mm -hmm. two nams ago maybe or something like yeah. that because yeah. i always see cj at nam like that's it mm -hmm. it's the only time i see him uh-huh that's funny yeah uh, yeah that that one was pretty yeah that was that was one of those kind of show up blasted out and 
yeah, get it done. Right. So, all right. So back to stuff you might have had slightly more involvement with. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, you, you talked about playing guitar early on, and mm -hmm. but I think you've started playing more and more and more as time has gone on. And you've become more involved writing. I mean, I know it's probably 10 years ago or so you were working on a record where you had co-written all this stuff. And this was like a, the first time like that had happened. And yeah. then... I want to talk about the Peter Himmelman collaboration you did. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I want you to talk about it okay. while I listen. Well, 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 yeah, the one about 10 years ago was, was this girl named Candace Marie. I really, you know, 2005 and then the 2008 thing, you know, around 2005, things started changing in the record business in general, right? Things started slowing down, became more hip hop oriented, became more less band oriented, let's say. Yeah. And, you know, and that's what I did. Like I bands, that's my thing and, and microphones and, and stuff. And, and so I set out to try and find somebody and develop them. And so I co-wrote a whole record with this girl, got my friends to play on it. Pete Thomas played on it. Davey Farragher, Lee Levin. Um, I was really happy with the way it came out. Actually, Roger Manning and Jeff Babco both played on it. Um, but you know, I couldn't get anybody interested in it. And then the artist kind of lost interest in it. And, and that was it, you know, a good learning experience. And, you know, that was what it was. And that happened around 2009 or so. Um, but it really whet my appetite to, pro to more production because I had done the Black Mollies in, you know, in 2004. And then I had, you know, produced a few other things or co-produced other things. And it's really where I wanted to, to head up, to end up eventually. Um, but then, um, so Peter Himmelman, I, somehow we became Facebook friends and he started posting things, just him walking around his neighborhood, just talking. Do you know Peter at all by no, chance? No, no. And, you know, he's, he's had a career as a singer songwriter. He's from Minneapolis. Um, then he ended up getting into TV scoring and he scored um, a, song, a show called Judging Amy for a few years and then another TV show, TV show called Bones. And he did a, several seasons of that. And so he, he was very successful doing that. Um, so anyway, we started hanging out and talking. And then he had a bunch of songs. He was talking about wanting to do a record. I listened to the songs. And then he had been sending me these random things he'd been writing. And he had been publishing them here and there. And I thought they were super interesting. And maybe it was just because where I was in my life and, and what he was talking about. I just really responded to the words. Um, so I went to meet him one day for lunch and I said, Hey, and as I was thinking, I'm driving there and I'm like, man, I like these songs, but I, I had the feeling he didn't want to put effort into reconstructing them or deconstructing them. I had a feeling like he was feeling like, well, these are the songs and this is kind of what I want to go with. And there were like 30 of them, but I kept thinking about these pieces. So I got there and I sat down. And the first thing he said to me was, what do you think about those pieces I've been writing? Would you want to do something with them? And I was just like, yes, this would be great. And then, so we developed this collaboration. I, I basically wrote pieces of music based on what the words were and how I thought they should feel. Um, got them to a point where I thought it made sense and I would present them to him. And if he liked them, then I would bring over a little portable rig and set up a mic and basically have him recite his words against the music bed. And we did that a couple of takes until we got it. And then that was it. I would take it off and, and kind of do whatever. But the whole concept was just really to be just found sounds and setting atmospheres and, and, and that kind of a thing. And, and that's why we included all the instrumentals along with all the vocal pieces on the final record. So, so the final looks like there's 22 songs, but it's right. really just 11 of one and 11 of the other. So, yeah. So that's the... <sighs> That's the full on push for that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's great. And it, it's a it's it's easy to, you know, want to do something like that, but you actually do it. And that's pretty badass, you know. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it was great to, you know, have sounds that I've collected over the years too and just find a way to incorporate them. You know, the wind and the wind chimes from being out in the front yard during a windstorm you know, the ocean, the neighbor's dog is barking, a train I was on in Berlin that was making a really cool rumble ends up in the very last song. Right. You know, there are all of these things. And then, 
Um, for better or for worse, I discovered this piece of software that allowed you to do binaural things. So I wanted to add a little extra dimension to the record and inspired by Chad and his whole black sky thing. I actually, if you listen to the record in headphones, it's a very different experience than just listening in stereo. Um, I try to incorporate a few things. Um, the S's on the vocal got a little mangled in the process, unfortunately, and, and um, in retrospect, but there are some cool things that kind of happen binaurally. Um, and there's a really great sax player on it who does some cool things. And, and this so, is the, anyway. the Deer VR? Yeah, plugin. exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The one where you can just point source things. Yeah, And I turned off, there's reverb processing as well. And, but I just turned off the reverb processing and I just, you know, would take one thing and put it in one place. And, and it, it seemed like it worked pretty well yeah. for that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so another record you've done relatively recently, which mm -hmm. is not one that you wrote, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it, I think it's a really interesting record is the Andrew uh, Sinewick. Record. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love it's that one. It's really cool. And it's got some really, I mean, from a, an engineering standpoint, it's got some major challenges. So I think <laughs> you want to just talk about that record. Cause that's, I, I'm pretty sure you put a track from that into one of your playlists, but again, if yeah, not, I did. Okay, good, mm -hmm. good. Cause people yeah. should definitely check the record out. It's, it's really, really cool. Thank you, Andrew. And, yeah. It's, um, you know, Andrew Sinewick is a Miami legacy guitar player. Um, he's a few years younger than us, but, um, he and I had been talking for years. We had met through somebody, I think Brian Monroney introduced us, introduced us. And we, um, basically he put a band together. He played at the baked potato. It was not what I expected at all. It was like the Allman brothers. Like I told you, the Allman brothers meets guys who can play over chord changes, two drummers, keyboard player playing organ and, and, uh, and Wurlitzer or Rhodes, sorry. Um, Sean Hurley on bass, who is brilliant. Tim Pierce, guitar player, sits in on a couple of tunes. And it was, people liked it so much, um, they encouraged Andrew, you know, you should make a record out of this. So Andrew contacted me. And so we talked about how to do it. And, you know, two drummers can be challenging. Um, so... I decided to lean into it instead of shying away from it. So I set up the drummers six feet in front of each other <laughs> and used no baffles, um, no baffles, four mics on each kit, five mics on each kit, stereo overheads, um, a kick, a snare, and then a mono mic a la Chad. Um, actually, one of them was a sound field mic on one of the kits. And then the other one was a, a, a Glenn John style over the high tom and the, and then I panned them slightly left and right, but not fully. Um, but the drummers worked well together. They sounded well together. Like their swings were similar. So that's why the whole record works is because those two guys are really simpatico when they play. Right. And then, um, yeah, we ISO Tim, we ISO Andrew, um, the bass, and then the, the B3. And off we went. We retracked that whole record in five hours. Right. No overdubs. And then I just, I mixed it, um, you know, processed a few things and, you know, had to, had to go through. I edited a few takes together where it need be, but, but it was literally recorded in five hours. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. But they were really well rehearsed. Again, this, this theme, right? Yeah. People who can really play, who are really well rehearsed. Yeah. It makes it happen. Yep. Catching the wave and, and rolling with it. Yeah. 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 So, all right, there's one last thing I want to mention, only because I'm such a huge fan, and I don't know how involved you were or not, but uh, the Bic Runga record you worked on. I, you know, it's funny, like, I've worked on two or three things for her, but I have no idea what was used. All right. <laughs> um, one of them was around the time of that Gemma Hayes record. Right. It was probably a little bit before that. It was with that same producer. Um, and that was at Sunset Sound. We recorded maybe a day or two, and I always thought she was super interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's funny, like I don't know, however many years later, it may have even been six or seven. She ends up doing something with Tom Rothrock, 
and I'm involved as well. Um, and I don't, I don't rem- I think it may have been just overdubs at that point. So I had right. recorded some drums or something like that at Tom's house and, 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 it, but she was the artist and, and we've had email exchanges. It's like she used to write me randomly and ask me about microphones and things like that. And, and I asked her, I called, I wrote her at one point to introduce me to a, to an artist who I wanted to meet and possibly work with. Um, but yeah, she's really interesting, but, yeah. but yeah, but like I said, I have no idea how any That's of it so was funny. ever used. <laughs> yeah, she's super talented. I did a, a, a seminar in New Zealand last year, mm-hmm. almost exactly a year ago, and she was one of the people there. And it's like, I'm, obviously, I know who she is. I've heard stuff, but it's it's just so intimidating. It's like, what the hell do I have to tell this woman? Like, she's, because <laughs> it's not like she's just a great artist. She has such a vision production wise. Just she's so, yeah. such a great record maker. Exactly. You know, and fearless and goes off in all these different directions. And so it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she's. Yep. I'm a big fan. So, look, what I would like to do now, because we've talked mm-hmm. a lot about, in case, unless there's like a project in particular that I missed out that you want to talk about. I don't know if there is. Well, the only other one actually or maybe two but but definitely like the mike landau record yeah 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 sorry that one that that just came out just over the summer it's called michael landau liquid quartet live and it was recorded live at potato right live at the baked potato yeah i brought down a 16 channel rig and mic'd everything up and and recorded it literally sitting right next to the band um the playing on it to me, it's just phenomenal. Abel Boreal Jr., um, Jimmy Johnson on bass, Mike, and a singer named Dave Frazee. And I mean, I just got super fucking lucky. It, it, that's, you know, the imaging on the overheads is just, it's, it's like the, it's like I, I don't get it that good in the studio sometimes. <laughs> and there's just something about the way it came together. The first nine out of 10 tunes are, um, all from the same night that we recorded two nights, but, but they were just on fire. So I, that record I really love. And then there was another guy named Howie Payne who mm. I thought that record was a real turning point for me and what I do. I, I only mixed it. A guy named Dom Monk recorded it who, who works a lot with uh, Ethan Johns. Right. And actually assisted Chad a bunch. So it was funny putting up tracks and seeing some of Chad's, ideas but you know interpreted by somebody else um but that record i really loved the way the mixes came out and it kind of set me on a whole new path of just listening and hearing things different that i think has really informed the last few years right of, of my work so i think it's great when that can happen when you not when you can get inspired by yourself in a way because you sort of take a chance or go further down a road or whatever you'd commit to something and then realize like oh right hold on a second and that that yeah. can happen and it will happen again and it will happen again and it's like yeah. it's always happening but yeah and 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 it's you know and to me it keeps coming back to this theme this being open this trying things this kind of you know listening and listening in a way um how do you put it i don't know it, it, I, I mean, listening is such a broad word. There's got to be better words for it. I just I can't think of them right now. But 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 you know, it's like listening with context, or maybe listening with like a flow of history behind you in a weird way. And and that just comes from a lot of listening and studying records and 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 all of that. But now I'm just going off on I don't no know what no I no. But it, it it is important because it's like you've got your own history, which mm-hmm. is obviously quite influential because it is your own history then you got the history of all the stuff you've listened to for years and years and years but you Mm -hmm. continually reassess or hear things from an era you thought you knew everything about that you've never even heard of like i heard pato for the first time like two or three years ago if you don't know this band pato i don't know that they are yet another of the 1970 1971 english bands Produced well, A and R'd by Muff Winwood, Steve Winwood's brother, who was A and R guy at the time. Listen to a track called "The Man," and it is okay. like the epitome of that '70s dry thing. But holy shit, 
Wow. Just mind-blowing. And it makes you completely rethink what you do. But I think the key to, to being open is to not... It's, it's this really weird balancing act between you have to have enough confidence to actually do work. And I often don't. Like, I, it's terrible. I'm really bad at that. But you need to be confident enough in your own work that, man, I'm going to make this amazing. This is going to be incredible. But to still realize you know absolutely nothing and it's all going to change and you're going to go somewhere else sometime, yeah. it's tough. Yeah. And, uh, and it comes down to allowing yourself to fail, too. Like, yeah. not feeling like you have to get it right or rush through it. You know, I mean, that there is something to be said for that. Well, but, but that was really, really well said. No, totally. Well, I think it part of, I mean, some people really don't like the way the mixing process goes now. But for me, I love it because I can fail on a song four times and no one will mm -hmm. ever know. It doesn't have to be done today. So I yeah. can get on to the next song tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know, it's great. So look, this mm -hmm. I think is a great segue to okay. get one of your students on the call. All right. Okay. Because I yes. think we this will is, chat about you know, that. You are one bit. of the, one of the great thinkers about this too. You constantly are assessing yourself and listening to what other people do and taking things and and then you figure out a way to actually teach it. And Thank you. some mm -hmm. kid named Mark apparently uh, he right, wrote into yeah. the show and he mm -hmm. said that he's been taking lessons from you and I'd like mm -hmm. to bring him on now okay. and you can talk about first of all your approach to it but then also kind of how oh hey it's Mark <laughs> hey <laughs> there he is Mark Hi. First hey. time caller, big fan, <laughs> long time listener, <laughs> long time listener. <laughs> oh yeah. man! So I'd love to talk. I'd love you to talk about sort of what got you into the idea of helping people mix, like the the coaching thing, and how you decided to structure it, and then you guys can talk about how it actually works. Okay, okay. Briefly, I mean, several years ago, somebody had called me, and out of the blue and just said, I'm having a problem mixing and I need some advice. And this guy really didn't need advice. He just, he just needed to have a little bit more confidence about what he was doing. And we never actually got together. So that was kind of the first little inkling. It's just like, wow, it's this guy, I was flattered that he would call me because I mean, there are people with way bigger credits and, and you know, and all that other stuff. But, um, and then Mark and I started talking maybe a couple of years ago now. And he was just like, hey, you know, can we find a way to get together and do this? You know, and, and have you teach me a few things, even though well, I'm in Ohio. Well, his words were, I want to steal all your tricks. Let's be yes. honest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, so he and I, we got together. We figured out how to do it, you know, um, you know logistically, you know, there's, there's, you know, some software. There's, there's using Zoom. There's using Skype. There's using, you know, audio movers. Um, and I realized after my first time working with Mark that, and, and I came up with the name of it right away. I call it Mix Therapy, and it's mix-therapy.com. That's, Which that's is accurate. You find about it. And, and <laughs> yeah. so... So I ended up sitting there with Mark a lot of the times and just going, why, what are you thinking about? Why are you doing this? And, um, you know, you know, in acting terms, what's your motivation? Um, what are you hearing? And, and it worked out really well. Like, like Mark a is a, is a great guy and very receptive and doesn't take things personally. And, and he beats himself up a little bit too much, but, but, you know, um, but he's trying to get, you know, he's, he's trying to get it together. Um, that's not true. Mark's <laughs> brilliant. And, and yeah, he does beat himself up about, about things, but only in the best way. Um, so, so yeah, we got this thing going and, um, and he felt improvement. I could hear the confidence come up in what he was doing. We streamlined a few things. We, we checked out some of his assumptions and some of his thoughts and we, we tweaked those as well. And, and I think he's been really happy and, and, and I've heard a difference in what he does and, and okay, now I'm going to shut up and let Mark say a word or two. So, <laughs> Oh no. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all that stuff. Um, yeah, it was, it was definitely fun going through some of the ways that I would just approach things like you, you develop habits and all of that. And mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that you really helped with was identifying those habits and then kind of, kind of breaking them you know, a little bit, or at least saying like, cool, you do that normally, do it a different way. You know, mm -hmm. how else could you do that? Or, you know, and just kind of making me think like, 
three ways around a problem instead of just going the one way that I, I kind of like gravitated toward. And Great. Kind of stuff. No, that's cool. No, that's really good to hear. Cause that is one of the things I really want to encourage. I want to get beyond the tools. I want to get into what they're doing, why they're doing them and, and applications, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And, and it's more questioning what people are, people are doing than me actually saying, do this and do that, because I don't yeah. want to mix somebody's record for them. Yeah, yeah. actually. Um, so like to help out with the conversation of it, what we did on one of our lessons, I don't know if you're approaching it the same with everybody, but John actually gave me, um, you know, we started with an entire song. So he, he just said, here's a multi-track. We're going to start this from scratch, do what you do. And that was kind of what was useful about you saying like okay cool it's like he's watching me import my template and saying okay well why these chains and all that kind of stuff and and working on it from there so it was a song from start to finish that we had worked through and that exactly was pretty fun yeah well it, it's my way to know because i know what the tracks sound like and that's the other you know there are x factors involved on my end that i have to make sure i i kind of you know get around and that's mm -hmm. That's definitely one of them. So yeah, the idea of you mixing and what's great is like everybody approaches it different and I'm not sitting there saying, do it one way or another. It's just like, Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's how you want to roll with it. Cool. And then, but why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know, why yeah. are you have these pan this way? And so, yeah. yeah. Why are you doing it wrong? Ha <laughs> 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 ha. Why do you have seven compressors no, it's on your I mean, mix it, bus? It's, the, it's like the pedagogical <laughs> version of the Lifeboat series, you know, where a bunch yes. of us mix the same song. But mm -hmm. this is the actually discussing, like, because we all discuss our sort of what we're thinking as we do mm -hmm. it, because that's the point of making those videos. But to, to do it as a teaching process, I think is brilliant. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, is it's, you know, my, my core thing is to make it about the student. Um, you know, harking back to our Miami days, you know, we had to teach other students so that they could get into the studios and use them. There was this whole mentorship thing that happened. And I used to love doing that. I used to love helping somebody figure out signal flow in their terms and on in their words using their vocabulary, because it's very much like producing, you know, all of that stuff really kind of intertwines for me at this point, which I really love. I feel like the production and this teaching thing, they're all kind of of the same spirit. You're just yeah. trying to help somebody get, you know, trying to really help somebody move along. In, right. In, well, in and way. if you're not already swamped with people, we should make sure the link, if you haven't already put the link in the chat. Yeah. Mark, yeah. The mix there. On the way to it. Um, oh, thank you. One thing I, I want to add is sort of a, a, a little plug for it. I have um, a pretty, pretty unique, like, um, I don't know, uh, privilege and not one that I take lightly of, of being able to like go on the, the peer mix shoots and, and sit in the room with you guys, and, like all of the mentors on the thing and, and watch over your shoulders. And while we're not, you know, we're not actually in sessions and we have the cameras and all that, and it kind of breaks up flow and all that. I, um, it's just, that's a huge thing for me to be able to sit in the room and, and learn from you guys, even though it's in that context and everything, it's amazing. Uh, and this was sort of, one step beyond that where it's, you know, being able to, to say, well, this is actually what I do on my rig and this is the sound that's coming out of that. And then for you to like raise red flags or, you know, to just be able to say like, I really want to work on drum compression today. That mm -hmm. kind of stuff is, is really, really useful. So awesome. Some no, of them that, kind of went great. that way where it's like, I'm struggling with vocal effects. Can we just talk about that? You yeah. Know, and, and, cool. and the approach is more like, I don't know, like jazz lessons or like, you know, where are you and then how can I help? It's not really like 101, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping most people know their rig enough so where I, I can ask to do something and I don't have to tell them the key commands and that kind of a right. thing. Well, um, I love the analogy to jazz lessons too. It's like you can't teach someone to solo, but yeah. you teach someone to solo. So, and that's what it is, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, I, it, that's funny, but but very very true. Yeah, and 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 there it ironically enough, there is a bit of a therapy component to it. There really mm -hmm. is, um, and so it's worked out. And the other interesting part is, like most of the students so far, they've been professional kind of at what they do. They're either teachers, 
there are other engineers, there, there are musicians who have been doing it for a long time. And they've been from all over the world, which has been fascinating as well. You know, Sweden, um, Norway, a um, couple of guys from England, a couple of guys from Italy, um, LA, um, New Orleans. Ohio. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been, and it's, it's been fun. So I, you know, I work around people's schedules where I can, they work around mine and, and it's, it's good. Yeah. It's super fun too. I really love doing it. That's brilliant. No. Well, Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for letting so me we talk got about any, it. Got any questions? We do. Yeah. Excellent. Are you uh, still up? You up for a few sweet. questions there, John? Yes, I am. Are you guys up? I feel like I've been talking your ear off. No, so. man. It's. I mean, look, it's beer o'clock for me, but that that's fine. It's always okay. beer o'clock for me, really. <laughs> okay. Perfect. This okay. is why we do it. Why we do it. Well, I'm happy to be here, and thank you again for having me, both of you. I, Thanks for I really being on. appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. This is great. Um, okay, so uh, our first question is from... Alejandro Alvarez, uh, John, how this kind of works, we're streaming to a platform called Crowdcast and okay. the crowd can uh, submit their questions and then it's kind of a like crowd voting system. So everybody upvotes each other's questions. Oh, so okay. So these are we, some uh, like the, the most popular ones. The most ones popular question. Yeah. Okay. Most popular one. So you did kind of touch on this already, but I don't know if there's something more to expand on. This is from Alejandro Alvarez and he says, hello, John, can you tell us more about the drum sound in Colossal Head from Los Lobos? Those drum sounds uh, are dirty, punchy, and clear all at the same time. Thank you. That is Chad Blake being Chad Blake. I mean, there's some form of compression on the kit usually, um, either a distressor or, um, or that devil lock thing that Chad got into. I, I don't remember when that started to become incorporated. Um, the clarity kind of comes from the head because he was – definitely using the head at that point. And, um, and, but this is the magic of Chad Blake, like definition, clarity, and grit at the same time and low end. Um, you know, the miking wasn't all, I mean, there's probably 421s on the toms. There's a 57 on the top of the snare, 421 or 441 on the bottom. 441 is the mono mic um, and the head. And no room mics or anything. So it was that little room. So, so yeah. And Pete Thomas, that's the other X that factor. That helps. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, yeah, I hope that answers it a little bit. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Next up, uh, we have a question, another one from Alejandro. Uh, and he says, when you have to work with other producers or engineers on a project, how do you divide the work to avoid arguing your problems? Um, at least for me, I defer to who I'm like, if I'm hired by this other person, then, then they're basically the boss. Mm -hmm. um, and my job is to help them do the best job possible. Um, you know, and if that means keeping my mouth shut, that means keeping my mouth shut. If that means saying, Hey, the, bass players playing a flat seven or the guitar players playing a flat seven and the piano players playing a major seven, you should probably check that out. You know, then that's mm -hmm. kind of my job too, but you know, don't be a jerk about it, but you know, but you know, that's going to come back later and bite you in the butt. Um, so I think it kind of flows naturally how the, the stuff kind of gets divided. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, next up. Uh, many people are asking, uh, this one's from Martin specifically, but this was in the chat earlier too. A lot of people are asking, uh, what is John's mic? Oh, right <laughs> now. Okay. This yeah. is a violet, uh, globe vintage that, and I'm looking at my pro tool setup and I'm seeing a, more peaks than I'm happy about. So hopefully it's not distorted. That's all right. We don't know how to record ourselves. It's fine. I, it's yeah. I mean, I keep looking at going, damn. Look, this, this is, is gonna already be gonna be one of the best sounding one of these ever. So don't worry about it. All <laughs> right. With the distortion even. Yes. yes yeah. Yes, and yes, I gotta yes. say that that mic is championed also by Joe Barisi. He's a huge fan of that particular mic. Yeah, right? actually the amethysts are the ones, the amethyst vintage. That's my favorite out of them. Um this one's kind of a, a U47 FET-ish kind of capsule and thing. Really good, though. I do like it. 
And anyway. they're still making them, right? I think so. I don't know if they're making this particular no, one, I, but yeah, I think those particular Violet's models, still kind of in it. Yeah, Violet's still around. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Uh, so our next one is from Sebastian, mm -hmm. and he says, "John, you're a great inspiration for a lot of us. How you manage the vocal chain, and or sorry, how do you manage the vocal chain and vocal effects when you're mixing?" Um. When I'm mixing, so I'm kind of looking to get the most energy I can out of the vocal. The first thing I do is look for problems, either room resonances, things like that, that might be a bit of an issue and deal with those first. Um, other technical problems, mouth clicks, mouth pops, stuff. There, there are tools that are great for that, like RX to get rid of those things. Um, anything I can do to make it the star attraction um, I'd like to parallel compress the vocal a lot. Um, so usually I'll find a compressor that I like as the main vocal and then put like a, an arouser or an 1176 with all the buttons pushed in or a devil lock. I mean, I probably talked about this stuff a lot on like the pure mix videos, especially lifeboats. Um, but those are the kinds of things I kind of go for at least off the bat, just feeling like the vocal is, is the star. And then effects, I mean, it, it's all really content dependent or context dependent. I mean, sometimes a vocal is great with the flanger on it, you know. <laughs> and sometimes we think the vocal is great with the flanger on it. And not mm -hmm. everybody does, but that's because they're wrong. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think we put a flanger on one of the songs we worked on on Mix Therapy. Actually, Probably, on, yeah. On the bridge it's, section yeah it's a recurring theme <laughs> for <laughs> me it should be. actually one of the songs on my playlist too a song called pour out your heart flange vocal on that too flanges nope. and phasers are awesome why wouldn't you use them exactly yes. i i hear you mm -hmm. um actually speaking of that uh we should mention that you have some stuff with overloud as well you have some reverb plugins yeah, I have a, uh, I did a whole um, reverb library for them, a uh, signature library for their Rematrix plugin, which I love. It's still kind of my main reverb that I end up using. Um, you know, spent a little time on it. Just, you know, there are samples of several reverbs kind of put together to create something unique. Yeah. Yeah. What um, was that process like? I mean, how did you get, I mean, did you actually sample rooms and yeah, I use some out of date hardware. I have some, you know, I sampled some spaces actually where I lived. Um, yeah, and it's, so it's, it was a combination of those kinds of things. Um, and then every one, I kind of just tried to make sure that it would work in a real world context. Um, you know, so like the ones that are like, say, the 70s Motown ish ones, I, I actually tried to make sure they would kind of work in that kind of realm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some people like them. I, actually, Barisi really likes them. He uses them a lot. He, he calls me a lot and says, yeah, I used it on this. I used it on that. It does what it says, you know, preset name, you know, claps, yeah. dark. I have dark claps. So I'm going to put it on that. It works. <laughs> so, you know, so we'll take well, it. Well, everything he does is dark. I mean, in the evil sense, <laughs> let's be honest. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the walking contradiction of Mr. Joe Barisi. Exactly. Definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nope. So okay. sweet and uh, so evil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you got time for one more? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Okay, so this one is from Adrian. Uh, and he asks, do you think mixing live today is as much fun as it used to be? COVID notwithstanding, of course. Oh, mixing live. Okay. Actually, Andrew, I was going to present this question to you and to Mark since you're, since we're on all together. Okay. Um, Mark, you'll probably know my answer to this. Um, if a live sound engineer should be licensed to use a subwoofer, what should a studio engineer be licensed to use? <laughs> a subharmonic synthesizer. I'm going to guess, but it's not it, is it? You got not something not else in, in my mind. opinion. Not in my you opinion. You got something else in mind. I don't know. Yeah. What would that be? Uh, Mark, any guesses? At least in my opinion. Well, what has he told uh, you to stop using some... more than once? Right. 
<laughs> well, it's <laughs> a long list. Um, there are a few. Uh, I would say something that messes with the groove. How about something that messes with the phase? Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You so, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what specifically are you thinking of there, John? I'm thinking any plugin that manipulates the phase. So like anytime you're digging into using MS stuff, I think you need to have a license to use MS. And I think as a plugin manufacturer, you need a license as well. And if your filters are causing phase anomalies across the crossover points, then you should just make them digital filters and call them a day. And if the digital filters don't work right, you shouldn't put it out at all. But that's me however many hours into this. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you feel about a mix knob? <laughs> ah, that too, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the phase crossover thing is difficult because unless you're going to have a huge amount of latency, there will be phase shift at the crossovers. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what filters do. Yeah. And analog ones as well as digital ones. It's just right. that's the nature of them. It's Yeah, but not being aware of it is insane. Yeah. And, and also too, like people, you know, there are a lot of these plugins that do phase manipulations that put stuff outside the speaker. So people can't get stuff wide. So they throw the phasey stuff on there. And I don't know if it's because of the time I spent with Chad and Chad used to use that cool SRS box that threw stuff out, outside the speakers. Yeah. But I've always been hypersensitive to phase. And so I get a lot of records to master that have this stuff on it. And I can't listen to it. Like, it feels like I'm listening to a fluorescent light bulb. I get a physical reaction to it. And, you know, and then subwoofers and a live gig. I mean, nobody, you know, how many live gigs have you been to where the bass player is playing the whole night and you don't hear a note he's playing because all you hear is the decay of the bass drum because no one has thought about that at all. So, so yeah, same kind of analogy. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> You you actually have more more to say on that subject though with the subwoofer stuff because it uh, we talked about it one time and it it was pretty enlightening to me um, and it was be on that note of the decay mm -hmm. of the kick drum that you're actually affecting the groove of the song and the timing of it yeah that, so. yeah you you you're, you all of those things I mean at least for me anytime you're you're talking about doing anything with the low end or with compressors, you have to be thinking about the groove. And if you're not, then you're gonna start obscuring the groove. And, 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 and then that's where things get fuzzy. That's where things start to, to take you off the rails. Mm -hmm. um, so, so paying attention to those details, at least for me, it feels like, it always seems like to me, it just gives you all the basic things. It, you're, you're building in your depth, you're building in width, you're building in impact and feel all at the same time just by keeping an eye on those things i think a, an absolutely brilliant example of that is the video that rich just had out on pure mix of the mixing mm. it's it's called like mixing 808s or something like that mm -hmm. but it is the perfect combination of these things it has mm -hmm. a drum loop that has phase issues it has a bass and then it has an 808 and his use of compression in this case he's actually elongating the 808 but taking attack away from it to make the groove more about the drums and less about the 808 and but he illustrates really really simply how to break that down into pieces and think about it and then piece it back together oh, so cool i'll have to check that out yeah oh. it's really i mean it's only like a week it's old good. i think that video or something yeah. like that yeah it's it's really good because sure it's a great too. example yeah. of exactly mm -hmm. that down in the low end and that's a question we always get like how do you manage your low yeah. end like well i have no idea how i manage my low end but Here's how you might think about it in one particular instance. So it's yeah. a, it's a great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and Vance, Vance's stuff and your stuff, uh, Andrew, you do this a lot too. Like uh, Vance will elongate snare drums to fill, you know, fill an entire bar sometimes if they need to and all that using compression. Yeah. And then, yeah, talking about that with you was pretty pretty eye-opening just in in the sense of like anytime that you're messing with decay times and reverbs and all that stuff if you're you can completely destroy what the drummer worked so hard to build yeah about. yeah yeah especially if the you know if the musicians are sensitive you have to pay deference to that 
you know, it, it, if they've spent the time and the detail and, and, you know, and, and, you know, some bands aren't that way, but if you're, if you're, if you're Steve Gadd or if you have, if you, you know, I mean, look, we're really fortunate that we've gotten to work with great players. I mean, you know, and, and there are great players all over the place though. And, and just being sensitive to a musician who, who, who is himself or herself sensitive, that goes a long way. Yeah. Totally. I mean, in, in, look, I love sub and there's like the best thing in the world is going to a show and they do the little sound check right before the band comes on. It's still the drum tech and they open up the PA for that one kick drum hit and it hits you in the uh -huh. chest like, oh, that's the best. <laughs> but it, it, I think where it's actually really, really a problem, and of course it hasn't been a problem this year because of the pandemic, but is in clubs. And I remember going mm -hmm. to see two gigs on, it may even have been consecutive nights at the Satellite in LA. And the first night, I don't even remember who the bands were. The first night was amazing. It was fucking awesome show. And then a different band the next night, the guy had the subs on and I had to leave. I couldn't, yeah. it was physically uncomfortable and I couldn't hear the music. So yeah. forget about the groove thing. You actually destroy the experience of being able to be in the room because the room was just resonating at the mm -hmm. same frequency all night. Yeah. And it yeah. was unlistenable. And it was the same room, same PA, and obviously someone had decided to switch them on and someone had decided not to. Yeah. Uh, I saw some shows in Pasadena a couple of years ago. They did this Arroyo Seco Festival and they had all these outdoor stages. Um, the meters played. I had to walk away. The subs were so loud. It just ruined the groove. And then... Uh, Willie Nelson's son, what's his name again? Nelson, you know. Yeah, that Nelson kid. <laughs> yeah, he did it. He did a set. His engineer turned down the subs. It was the best sounding thing I had seen at that stage, and like in in the whole time. I even as he walked away, I even said something to him. Yeah, you and know? look, it, it's it's yeah. I we don't have to go into it any more than that. But it it is it's a trap you can fall into in any part of. The audio industry but even outside the mm -hmm. audio industry it's it's a gimmick really that yeah. when used properly can be a holy shit thing and Absolutely. just be the best thing ever yeah but if it's not it really mm -hmm. does make listeners have a hard time getting the yeah. music do you know this um uh kendrick lamar tune uh uh called uh loyalty with uh, rihanna on it on the damn record mm -mm. uh Derek Ali mixed it. I don't know who produced it, but there is a whole sub symphony that goes on and it's brilliant because you can listen on speakers without subs and the record comes across. You listen to speakers with subs and there's this whole beautiful thing that happens on the low end. The producer just did this amazing thing and, and, and Derek got it to, got it to speak. So you know, so granted, we're talking a recording application, but still, it is possible. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But it, it can't it can't be a substitute for getting your low end right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You got to do the work. You got to do yeah. the work. You got to do the work. Well, that seems like... Take your top off. That <laughs> seems like a, uh, a natural place to, uh, to end here, John. Yes, you yes. You got to do I... the fucking work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's been amazing. Yeah, thank it's you. Been great. Um, yeah. Hey, maybe I can interview you one day. <laughs> I don't know. That's been tried. That's A lot tried. of your comments. I, I have. I now I have questions. So now I'm going to do some research. All right. So, well, so I gotta we say, I gotta say that the. Um, I don't know what our. We don't really have a schedule, but the between two shores thing. Uh huh. There is one with with Mr. Paterno, mm -hmm. but I would like to say there is one with my daughter Xanthi interviewing me. Okay. So if anyone is going to interview me, she was she's got to be top of the list. Okay. Cause okay. She'll be first. All right. When that yeah, one's she gave done. me a very hard time, I seem to remember. <laughs> she was very, very proud of herself afterwards. I so. gave you kind of a hard time, you too, did. I think. You did. Yeah. But in a, in a jovial, fun way hopefully fun yeah oh, yeah I absolutely feel, and yeah. she i've seen i've seen the footage from from ours and and she even makes a little off-camera cameo which is pretty funny awesome yeah Great. so hopefully that one will be mm. coming out soon 
Okay. You can tell that you guys have been friends for over 30 years in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shaking my Excellent. head no for the podcast listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So look, just a reminder for everybody listening, please get your questions in. Go to the, the Pure Mix webpage for this. Uh, and yeah, and the podcast is out. And I promise they'll start sounding good in like 34 weeks. So that'll be good. Maybe mine. No, no, this it's going to sound great. But I do love it's fa- like you recorded your audio, and you're like, oh man, it's peaking. R- Dave Way recorded his last week, and then he's mm-hmm. he sent me an email like, wow, I, I crushed this a hell of a lot more than I thought I was. <laughs> We're terrible at recording ourselves. Well, you know, because you get up to the mic and you're going one, two, three. It's like it's like getting drum sounds, right? Yeah. Give me the kick, give me the snare, which is why I never do that. Play the drums. Yeah. Because now I'm playing, and I'm just I'm. Yeah, totally different. Projecting. Yeah. Totally different. So, yep. Steve Lily White next week. Questions. Excellent. Get me questions. Uh, that's all, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fantastic. So now's the time where we all wave, and then at some awkward moment, I will mute our microphones and go to a black uh, or a thanks for watching screen. I think. Okay. Right. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks. Bye. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.